Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, I hope everyone's having an excellent day, and we're excited to be back again this year for Tau Days. Um, we have a really great lineup that we're really looking forward to sharing with you and gaining the perspective of a lot of great leaders in assessment. So before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few quick items. Um, during the presentations, audience members will be muted and we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the sessions. So please feel free to drop any questions that you have into the chat or the Q&A box and we'll answer those, uh, like I said, at the end of the session. Um, and today we're excited to get things started off with a campfire chat between our founders and it's our pleasure to introduce them to you. So. Uh, we have Mark Oswald. Mark is the co-founder and CEO here at Open Assessment Technologies, which he launched in 2013 and established as the de facto market leader for open and innovative assessment solutions. Mark is a vocal proponent of interoperability and open standards, and he has spearheaded achievements with the IMS Global Learning Consortium in the United States to improve standards compliance and provide end users with a stronger voice in setting the direction of assessment technology. In recent years, Mark has worked closely with leading ministries of education in Europe to launch Flip Plus, a fast growing, a fast growing organization that embodies the sharing economy in assessment. We also have Patrick Plishar, who is our co-founder and director of products at Open Assessment Technologies, where he is strongly involved in the field of computer-based assessment, conducting research and solutions management for national projects at OET, and pioneering many countrywide TAO deployments. He's also managed software engineering aspects of international large-scale surveys, including PIAC and PISA. So it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to uh, Mark and Patrick. Yes, hello everybody. It's a hello. pleasure to be back and hi Patrick. Hello Mark, how are you? Uh, doing very good, thank you. Uh, yeah, a year ago when we uh, started the Tower Days again, it was after several years of uh, hiatus so. where we focused on commercial trade shows and conferences. And so uh, we were really pleased a year ago to see so many people joining us again for the Tower Days uh, in virtual format. And so that encouraged us to, to continue doing this. And what a year it's been. Indeed, crazy year. Uh, a lot of uh, big news uh, that were announced uh, recently, yeah. uh, including uh, the transaction uh, with uh, Uchida. Mm -hmm. uh, we are really excited about this, uh, this news. Um, I think we, we consider with Uchida's experience in the tech market, we, we consider this is uh, one of the best shareholders we can have by right? bringing all their experience they are also very, Uchida is very committed into open standards and uh, open source, which is, you know, very well aligned with uh, mm. all the, the journey, right, that we were yeah. pursuing so far. So Yeah, and, and it provides the stability and the continuity that our customers are expecting from us. And uh, because and anytime you, you have such a transaction, there's, there's a risk of disruption. And here we, we designed it on purpose so there wouldn't be any disruptions, not for the company, not for our partners, and, and not for our customers. And uh, like, like you just said, it's a strong endorsement of our product roadmap, uh, a strong endorsement of our standard strategy, and uh, coupled to the, the shareholder transaction, there's actually also a significant uh, monetary contribution that we right, received yeah. to continue developing the Tau roadmap and implementing new functionalities. Yeah, it shows the commitment from Uchida right, to really make an impact and improve education with this uh, extra investment. And, uh, and we will talk about it a bit later, I think, uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, what we want to achieve in terms of roadmap, where we want to go. And uh, Uchida is fully aligned with what we want to, to achieve there in the market. Yeah. Well, exactly. And uh, when 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 you go through so many stages of growth as as our company has uh, last year we we were uh, thinking back to the early days when we were just eight people and 
indeed, when when we started, we had no customer signed, just a lot of confidence from a handful of investors. And uh, we we deliver and we delivered not just because of the team, but also thanks to our customers. Because when when you are such a young organization, um, there's always doubts, right? Will will they be able to, to pull it off? Will they be able to deliver? And our customers trusted us. Uh, they trusted the team and the technology that we were uh, working on, and of course the services that we provided to them. And I think with this uh, transaction with Uchida Yoko, it's our turn now to to give that confidence back, uh, because now uh, we are part of a two billion euro edtech giant, uh, which means that the the future of of Tao and the future over over T is is rock solid. Um, so. And and that that's our way of of course giving back to to our customers and why I said stability and continuity, uh, because uh, that we we're going to continue developing products, going to continue implementing technology standards, uh, which which is really why customers choose Tau in in the first place. Like standards, right? Because mm -hmm. I and mean, one of the, the recent news also I, I've learned uh, last week is that you know Uchida is so much committed into open standards that they got some awards recently with the LMS system LGA. So they got an award. There. I think they are in the top three best LMS uh, based on standards. So yeah, their commitment to standards is really well aligned with ours. I would say so. Yeah, that's um, good. Uh, and good and good relationship also, right? With, with all the yeah, Uchida exactly. people. And many people here you may not know that, but. Uh, we've been working with Uchida Yoko for almost seven years. Uh, they are our strategic partner in Japan. And it's thanks to all of their hard work that uh, we can now count the Japanese Ministry of Education among the, the Tao users, um, Tao user group, and also a presence in FLIP. And uh, so, so yeah, we, we've known each other for a long time. There's a lot of trust, a lot of mutual understanding, which, which is really great. And um, so now look, looking ahead, I mean, uh, Sam men mentioned at the beginning, we launched the company in 2013 and now we're 23. So this year is a nice round anniversary, and we're actually going to be celebrating that in just two weeks. Uh, looking forward to that. And uh, but then there's some some other news, right? Uh, over the last year, there's Pisa. Indeed, it's like uh, going back at the the origins, right? Because we actually started, you know, doing OECD studies, and uh, indeed, since last year. Thanks to the cooperation of one of the leaders uh, in this uh, kind of international study, uh, ESA, we were offered basically to provide all the technology for, for PISA. So as you know, right, PISA is, uh, I think maybe go on with, correct me, I think it's about 90 countries for 2025 uh, cycles, so different subject matter, including innovative domain. I, I think this time, uh, innovative domain is learning in a digital world, so much more uh, advanced uh, uh, assessment and when it, uh, with really innovative uh, uh, assessment uh, items. So yeah, it's uh, it brings a lot of uh, challenge to us. But actually, the, the good news is PISA actually brings a lot of new contributions to to the core version of Tau. I mean, there will be key new functionality. Or I could maybe list them right. So one of them is the school readiness tool because obviously with eighty countries. Since PISA, I mean, the, the primary uh, use case would be to try to go online as far as possible. So obviously, we need to make a diagnostic about the, the school infrastructure. So we build this uh, product. It checks for the bandwidth. It checks for the web browser. It also checks for availability of the microphone, whether it works or not. Um, since in, in PISA 2025, they want to assess foreign language assessment as well, so speaking proficiency. So that's one, right? The school readiness tool, also an offline capability, because obviously we need to accommodate those uh, schools and countries where the uh, environment is not ready yet to go 
to go uh, fully online. So we are building a full offline uh, capability there. I mean, today it's still a bit flavored for, for Pisa, but in the future we want to basically contribute that back for the community, for, for all uh, the users there. Well, maybe hopefully they will have the possibility to publish a test and specify that um, this test needs to be available in the offline local appliance, and then the offline local appliance will will get this test translation. We get what eighty languages, probably more than that because of the the variation of the the languages. Stage adaptive design also, right? In Kida, they do this, including misrouting. So it's a nice proof of concept that we have all the capability there in terms of multi-stage adaptive design including branching rules, preconditions, et cetera. So yeah, I think for me, PISA, it's, um, it's really strategic. It gives us a lot of, uh, of recognition uh, in, in the world globally, but it also gives us a lot of functionality. This is what, what is uh, really interesting here yeah. for, for the community. Yeah. Yes, and, and we're going to hear more about it. Um, Probably. Yeah. We have uh, speakers from ACER and OECD uh, this afternoon. And uh, there is, of course, uh, you mentioned uh, the innovative domain in PISA, and I, I think it's going to be really crucial uh, for assessment as a whole uh, to, to have more competency-based assessments. And uh, a good recent example is, and you've probably all been seeing the, the headlines about artificial intelligence and chat GPT, passing the MBA exam, passing the bar exam. And, and then, of course, shortly after Czech GPT passed the bar exam, uh, there were two lawyers in the United States who relied on Czech GPT to prepare a court brief. And turns out that Czech GPT started hallucinating when it was composing the court brief. And now the, the two lawyers are in, uh, in legal trouble because in the end, they submitted fraudulent, uh, incorrect, or fake uh, legal documents uh, to the court, and now they, they risk this bond. And the, the irony here is that you have AI passing the bar exam and then producing fake court documents. And uh, of course, the, the question this inevitably raises is, well, how good really is the bar exam? and all these other exams, right? And do they truly measure the, the skills that we expect uh, these professionals to have? And I, I think a case can be made that in, in many uh, situations, the exams fall short of truly measuring these types of skills and competencies. And I think that's why the innovative domain of OECD is so uh, important. And so we, we have presentations this afternoon about this. Uh, we also have presentation because one of the skills here is critical thinking. And so we have a, a presentation lined up from you from the, the founder of MACAD who provides uh, leading tools to, to measure and analyze critical thinking skills. And we also have another great speaker lined up, uh, Alina Fondavier, who's with Duolingo, and uh, who's going to talk about responsible use of AI and actually contributed to uh, an important white paper, actually the first one I have seen on, on this topic. Uh, so really, really looking forward to, to the Indeed. this afternoon. And when it comes to, to AI, well, I mean, obviously, so at OET, we, we are going to comply with, uh, uh, you know, uh, some sort of manifesto of uh, responsible usage of AI because obviously it's a, it's a brand new technology. Everyone is looking at it. Everyone is using it, etc. But there might be so much abuse of it, right? I mean, we need to be very careful about how we we leverage this kind of brand new technology. And I mean, to share a little bit um, from OET point of view and in terms of of own map, we. We, we want to make uh, a core full usage of it and still include the, the human uh, factor uh, into it. I can share that, for example, one of the use cases we were considering first of uh, this kind of large language models, uh, generative AI, was more to maybe boost creativity of item also, 
to suggest to them uh, maybe ideas of item to suggest to them destructor etc but not really like going into a fully automated way right so still you know rely on humans to to make some sort of sign off or maybe uh, iteratively uh, uh, enter a dialogue with this generative AI to get you know more uh, ideas so it's more about originating items right rather than leveraging AI uh, for automated scoring or you know th those other use cases where, where things are a bit more uh, sensitive so um, at this stage of things uh, on our side we, we we rather use it to originate new items uh, give them um, yeah boost their creativity there well. and we're going to do this in partnership with list the sure. Luxembourg yeah, Institute sure. of Science and Technology which was uh, an early backer of OAT and uh looking we we have a long stand, almost two decades of working relationship yeah. with this and they, 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 they are yeah they have a, a good experience in um uh, you know handling all those large language uh models and generative ai and i, I think the great thing because i mean of course we, we could maybe you know think of, of using ChatGPT or, or this kind of uh, commercial uh, models uh, but when it comes to assessment, I think we need to specialize a little bit the, the model there so that we have a bit more uh, mm -hmm. accurate uh, suggestion of items and destructors. So, and I, I think list will provide us this, this kind of expertise. On, uh, yes, expertise. Yeah. And, and thanks to this partnership, uh, we'll also be eligible for uh, grant funding, uh, R&D grant funding from the Luxembourg government. And so that that's part of the story. Like I mentioned earlier, the the contribution from Ochida Yoko to continue developing Tao products. Uh, we're also getting financial contributions thanks to to List and through the the grant requests that we're preparing for the Luxembourg government to to really also do more of the fundamental research that is needed for for these type of use cases and and technology. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, with, with this funding, I mean, we 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 hope that it, it will accelerate significantly, right? Uh, the the core uh, development, the, the key features uh, for all our, our users. There is also uh, another trend that we are seeing in the market that is, uh, you know, and a lot of ministries of education more and more, they want to provide uh, the tools for teachers to conduct more continuous assessment during the, the school year. So beyond uh, diagnostic or summative uh, assessment, they want also to give uh, tools really for schools, for teachers to autonomously uh, conduct their own day-to-day -day, uh, assessment. And obviously, this is, uh, this is a shift for us, right? I mean, uh, TAO has been primarily designed for professionals, right? So that's why you have all, you know, all those features, all those options, right? Which makes things a bit complex, right? So if we think in terms of offering uh, a product suite now for teacher to be in control and to decide on a day-to-day -day basis, to maybe to assign some uh, formative assessment to, to their kids in their classroom, we need to build, you know, a new, uh, a new user experience, a new products uh, there to really make their job easy because we need to be mindful also about their time. I mean, we, we cannot, uh, ask them to spend hours to assemble a test. It has to be uh, real quick uh, uh, there. So, and along those lines, along this shift, right, towards formative assessment, we are going to release uh, a product that is called Tao Portal. Uh, so it's going to be, the first version will be released end of June uh, this year. And the portal, it's really a product intended for, for teachers to be in a position themselves to you know register their students in their classroom and to assign them a selected test and basically monitor the activity so from the back of the room they will see on their screen the progress of all the students they will be able to grant them uh, extra time for some of them uh, they will be able to see if they are blocked on some specific question so it's really you know product intended for this more uh, formative setup classroom setup uh, let's say Right. And uh, so that's one of the, the first uh, product we will release uh, to meet this you know, shift into continuous assessment uh, toolbox for teachers. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the, the nice thing of, of, about Tau Portal is that it's going to provide a, a universal entry point for all of the products that we've been working on over the last couple of years. Um, as, as you may know, or, or maybe not, uh, Tau, the, the Tau product family has been growing over, over the last years. And so we now have dedicated products for test delivery. The new generation, next generation, as we still call it, is, is called Tower Advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a accessible uh, test delivery component. Uh, it was designed for accessibility from the ground up. Um, so that's a new component. Then we have uh, the Tower Grader. Uh, so for human uh, graded answers, teacher graded answers, um, and then of course an analytics component that's also new, Tower Insights, um, and then of course the the authoring environment that you were talking about, Patrick. And so right. the, these all being products, uh, you need a new mechanism mechanism to 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 steer the users to the features that they require. Correct, yeah. and that's really the, the portal, right? The entry point to all those features from all our product suite. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make it as easy as possible for a person uh, that would be the teacher or educator in this case, for them to be able to access all those features, not knowing all the specific details and functionality of all those products, right? So basically the teacher in this case, like in a portal, they will, you know, monitor the classroom session for one ongoing test, and they will have, you know, a button for each student maybe to review the test as corrected by Tau Advance. Right. So, but they won't have all the details about all the projects. They will just have the test review. They will be able to access the reports from Tau Insights directly from the portal. So that's the idea. Right. It's kind of a single entry point, seamlessly integrating all the features from all of our products. Yeah. Exactly. And and based on the the user type or the role of the person who logs in. We expose the functionalities that the they are supposed to to see, and uh, so a question we we get in in this regard is also about open source licensing, because uh, Tau Portal, the very first release, will come in ten days from now, uh, but then Tau Advance has been in production, Tau Grader, Tau Insights. Uh, but they've not been released on GitHub yet, and uh, we are going to do that uh, this year um, in, in fall timeframe. Uh, we want to make sure that the code is well documented, um, the, that the, the licensing uh, headers are all properly inserted. And so for those of you who have been using Tau, we have a lot of open source uh, users, Tau core users, uh, so you know that uh, Tau 3.x uh, has been released under or is licensed under GPL version 2. And uh, it's been available under GPL version 2 for like almost 15 years now. And one of the things that, that we noticed during these years is that um, we felt like we're missing out on some contributions. Uh, so we had users who, who took the code and we know they did some really great modifications to it. Um, and we would have loved to, to have those come back to the, the community, but uh, for the, a range of reasons, the, the people who, who modified it choose to not contribute back. And so one thing we, we want to change in the future is uh, to to, to no longer have this kind of situation. And so there is a, a version of GPL uh, that's based on GPL version three um, called Afero GPL, which actually requires modifications to be contributed uh, the moment you, you make the functionality available. Uh, so it has a broader definition of what source code distribution is, and what's special about Atero is that it includes cloud-based distribution uh, as, as a situation where you need to, to, to share your modifications with the community. 
Correct. Yeah, I think so. So Alpha GPL is is still uh, an open source license uh, approved by the the what what is their name again? O open source uh, initiative by OSI. Yeah. So it's it's a subtle difference there, uh, indeed. And and the yeah the driver is for us to to be in a position to um, ask uh, for contributions when the, the source code is uh, is modified uh, by other because uh, it's it's fair, right? I mean, um, they benefit from everything we have built. We want to benefit from everything they have built. So it's just this subtle uh, change. So, yeah. And, and it opens the door for those users who do want to keep their changes proprietary. There is actually a way to, to couple Apero GPL with commercial licenses. And so it doesn't close the door to those of you who want to keep their modifications proprietary. But I, I think it, it establishes a, uh, a bigger incentive for people to contribute back, which, which it is all about. So, okay, so I, I think we're, we're getting close to uh, the half hour here. Um, so, and we want to keep a few minutes for, for questions. Uh, you, you may have to us, so I think we're going to uh, be quiet now and uh, give the word to, to Sam and uh, our participants who, who may have questions before we go on with the agenda. For some, we can't hear you, maybe it's just- oh, Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Um, thank you, guys. Uh, it's really exciting to hear about um, the new open source initiatives coming for Tau. Um, we do have some time for Q&A. If you have any questions for Mark or Patrick, any questions about our open source um, product, please feel free to drop them into the chat, um, and we are happy to answer them. Don't look like there are any questions except the greetings from Morocco. So <laughs> greetings also. Yeah. Thank you. If there are any other questions, uh, feel free to send us a, an email uh, anytime. Uh, it will be a pleasure to respond to to you. Yeah, and we can put your email addresses in the chat as well, um, where you'd like to have uh, any of the participants reach out. Right. So we are going to have our next presentation coming up in just a few minutes. If there are no questions, actually, I think there is a question. Oh, no, just a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to have our next session coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, as Mark and Patrick talked, about the PISA assessment program. We're going to have uh, two speakers dive into that a little bit more deeply, discussing um, learning in the digital world and the digitization of PISA. Uh, so we're going to have ACER, um, the Australian Council of Educational Research, and also the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, we have our two speakers, Dr. Goran Lezendik of the uh, Australian Council of Educational Research. So Dr. Goran Lezendik is the Research Director of Assessment Data and Analytics at ACER. And before joining ACER in 2019, he was Senior Manager of Research and Development with the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, ACARA. And while at ACARA, he designed an innovative cross-grade system of multi-stage adaptive tests for the National Assessments Program, Literacy and Numeracy. He served as a Senior Assessment Specialist with UNESCO International Bureau of Education and is an Honorary Associate at the Center for Educational Measurement and Assessment at the University of Sydney. Dr. Lizendik holds the role of International Survey Director for the OECD's PISA 2025 survey. We also have Dr. Mario Piacentini, a Senior Analyst for the Organization for Economic and Cooperation and Development, or OECD. Dr. Piacentini is a social scientist with over 10 years experience developing measurement frameworks and indicators. 
Dr. Piacentini is responsible for extending PISA to new assessment domains and leading research to innovate assessment technologies and methodologies, where he dedicates his energies to developing valid measures of 21st century skills to innovate the design of education assessments. So we're going to start things off with uh, Dr. Lizendik, and he is going to take us into the first part of this presentation. And uh, Dr. Piacentini will be uh, following up, and then we'll have a uh, joint Q&A at the end of the session. So it's my pleasure to turn it over uh, to the both of you. Oh, all right. Is there a screen sharing a function? Yep. Um, yes, you should be able to share your screen um, in the little green button down below. Yep. Great. Um, thanks for this introduction and thanks for the invitation. Um, so I will spend some time talking about the transition, uh, transitioning PISA to online assessments. Um, just a brief introduction. Uh, PISA is a part of this, the International Large Scale Self Assessment Programs. It is the OECD program for international student assessment that started back in 2000. Uh, PISA tests are designed to assess how well 15 year old students can apply their knowledge to real life situations. And that separates PISA from a lot of other uh, assessments. Uh, PISA um, and the international large scale assessment in general provide information of how educational infrastructures, policies, um, and context uh, operate and how related factors might contribute to the educational and social outcomes across different schools um, and countries. Um, as Patrick mentioned, we're expecting around 90 countries um, to participate in PISA 2025. Um, this is just a map uh, showing the countries that participated in 2018 cycle. Um, um, obviously, there was a PISA 2022 that was disrupted by um, the COVID situation. Um, it is worth noting that PISA is now moving to a four-year cycle. Um, and the, after 2025, the next PISA cycle will be in 2029. The PISA assessments, um, as, as, as all other previous domains, um, has a number, a number of, of, of assessments um, that together uh, combine into a survey um, that includes um, assessment of student knowledge through cognitive innovative domains, but also uh, provide a wealth of information or context and background of students. Um, and often, um, and, and in addition to this assessment, uh, PISA always has an optional assessment. Um, so for the 2025, uh, the cognitive domains are mathematics, uh, reading and science with science being the focus of the assessment, which means that the new assessment framework has been developed for the science um, uh, test in PISA. And in 2025, science is, will, will be the last cognitive domain that is being transitioned to multi-stage adaptive um, tests. So the transition of um, PISA assessment to multi-stage adaptive started with the reading test in 2018. Um, then the mathematics was, um, was transformed into adaptive test in 2022. And now it's, uh, now it's time for science to be, uh, for science to be uh, presented to students as a multi-stage adaptive test. Um, as you heard, before, innovative domain for PISA 2025 is the learning in digital world. Um, and uh, Dr. Bentantini will talk a bit more about that in his presentation. Um, the contextual background information is collected uh, from students, teachers, parents, and schools. And the optional assessment for 2025 is foreign language assessment uh, in English. 
So students uh, in approximately 20 countries will be assessed in um, knowledge of English reading, listening and speaking. Um, and why is that an interesting fact? Um, this is because this will be the first time that students are um, listening to the stimulus in a listening test and they're responding by talking. So we are, um, we, we are presenting the, the, the audio recording, we're collecting the audio recording from students and that um, presents a challenge for the test platform, but also for the implementation assessments in the schools. Um, we talked about the assessments uh, that that we will be implementing in PISA 2025. Um, I want to talk now a little bit about more about the brief and task for the 2025 cycle of PISA. So the key task for the 2025 cycle is transition of PISA assessments to online test delivery platform. PISA has been computer-based um, assessment. Um, since 2015. Um, however, that delivery was um, is, is not an online. It's a sort of appliance-based delivery where each student is issued a, a USB device from which students can access to the test material. Um, and that obviously has significant, um, significant um, restrictions in terms of the, just the logistics of delivering assessment across the schools, logistics of collecting the, the, the devices, USB devices back to the national centers um, and each, or each country and participants in PISA, um, uh, the assessment are administered by the national center who have the operational control over the, over, over the, the the test in, in their jurisdiction. Um, and so uh, obviously the size of the devices, the type of information that can be passed from the device back to the computer, these are all limitations that led to um, OECD decision to move PISA to online platform in 2025. Um, in addition to transitioning a PISA to online test delivery platform. Um, the challenge is, as I said, to move the science to a uh, multi-stage adaptive test, but also to deliver um, to deliver the, all these assessments as the adaptive tests, um, which means that we are dealing with a large number of uh, parallel assessments that we need to provide um, test platform with the means to react to student results and in real lifetime uh, branch students to the appropriate test uh, content. Um, I also mentioned the challenge uh, that we have both in a learning in digital world um, that needs to deliver a complete assessment tasks um, and also to a speaking and listening Task, uh, task in the foreign language assessment. These are all um, novel challenges for uh, the PISA, but also novel challenges for the test delivery platform in, 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 um, in international, in, in a large scale international uh, surveys. So I'm gonna spend the um, rest of my um, presentation discussing um, some of the challenges for the delivery of PISA online tests, but these are the challenges that we that, that equally apply to all the uh, large-scale international um, assessments. Um, so the four groups of challenges um, are obviously jumping um, at, at us. So the first one uh, relates to technical infrastructure to deliver the online test. Um, Related to technical infrastructure are the issues of access inequity for all of the participants. Um, um, and obviously with the online delivery, um, the questions are raised about the security and the privacy of data um, and security of test materials. 
and and finally there is a there is a change management uh, perspective to the delivery of online assessment and how and 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 related to that change management there is a question of technical support and training that needs to be provided to um, national centers to to test administrators on the ground to deliver uh, the international surveys according to a very strict technical standards. Um, and the reason why we have strict technical standards in PISA is that we can be certain that when we are uh, publishing uh, comparative results for the participating countries and the economies, that, um, that all results in, um, come from the same playing field, that they're all Processes, procedures um, across all of the participating countries and economies have been conducted in a transparent uh, and fair and a fair manner. During talking a little bit about the technical infrastructure, um, it will not come as a surprise to state that even in 2025. We expect that access to technology uh, will remain um, the challenge. Um, and if we are looking at PISA globally, PISA um, obviously started with the OECD countries and include uh, a number of uh, a number of um, highly developed countries. But PISA family now includes 90 countries across all of the globe, and the global access to the technology um, and more importantly, familiarity uh, and the frequency that students use the technology and devices in everyday school life um, is still is still um, is still a challenge. Um, the internet infrastructure availability and robustness is still a challenge, um, and it's still a challenge not just in developing world but also in in. In, in advanced economies. There are pockets of countries um, where the pocket of countries in a country like Australia, where an inf in internet infrastructure is still um, is still um, um, you know, leave a lot to be desired. Um, and all of these factors taken together um, could have impact both on the um, representatives of schools and students within the country, now our ability to draw a fair representative sample within the country, but also, of course, can impact the comparisons between between countries, uh, which is one of the key goals um, of, of the international large scale assessment. Um, related to technical infrastructure is the question of access and equity. Um, in transitioning PISA to online assessment, we have added uh, not just aspect of devices, but also um, um, internet connectivity. So the digital divide now basically cover all of the all of the modern uh, technology uh, access to computer devices, the quality of the devices, access to the internet, the quality of the internet connection, the robustness of internet connection. Um, and, and so on. So um, what seems to be the solution? Um, obviously, the key in resolving these issues is to provide a solution uh, that has um, like technological demands, like the Tao platform that is browser-based, um, that does not require any additional software to deliver assessment, or uh, access to student devices. Um, one of the, the biggest problems that we are facing in large scale assessments these days is this complexity of the device ownership and who can access student devices, who can, um, who can uh, change the settings and setup on student devices, uh, who can install a software on, on, on student devices. All these uh, concerns have to be taken into account. And one of the solutions that we are implementing in PISA in 2025 is a Tao platform that is um, solely browser-based, 
as it does not require any additional software to be installed on students' devices. Um, all that students need to participate in PISA uh, uh, 2025 is a, a robust internet connection, a username, and the password. Uh, obviously, that's not enough. We have to acknowledge that there are uh, countries and schools where access to internet will be problem in 2025. And for that reason, uh, an offline solution is absolutely needed. Um, the offline solution um, has to be, again, um, has to have a light technical uh, footprint, has to be easy to implement and has to provide, and this is most important, uh, has to provide exactly the same student experience um, for the students participating in offline assessment as the students who are participating in online assessment. And this is where we are working with our colleagues in OIT to deliver exactly such solution for PISA 2025. Um, in terms of the security and privacy, um, a multi-layered approach is required. There is no a, um, a silver bullet that can solve all of the security and privacy problem for the online assessment. Um, that multi-layered approach include technical measures, uh, include test administrators training, includes monitoring and evaluation, um, and includes robust policies and procedures. So when we are talking about technological measures, these technological measures um, really have to um, reduce and eliminate um, chances of unwanted students' behavior, such as students leaving test player, such as students um, um, kind of looking for the, the, what other information they could glean outside of the test player on their devices or, or if they have, um, um, and, and, and so this has to be complemented with the test administrator training and awareness. However, there are also technical solutions that we can implement in a browser-based um, platform to support um, the secure delivery of the assessment and to reduce um, and eliminate um, unwanted behavior during the test taking, um, during, the, during the test taking. And of course, um, importantly, um, um, we have to protect the test material. So we have to prevent students from being able to copy um, and transmit test materials. Um, and uh, we are working on the series of technical solution for PISA 2025 to address exactly those questions. Um, test administrators training and awareness uh, support is uh, very important. Uh, moving to online assessment, as we said, it's opening up a lot of opportunities for the innovative assessment, but our test invigilation, our test administration practices has to evolve with those practices and be aware of the challenges of the online test delivery. Um, we are obviously um, needing to have a robust set of measures to monitor and evaluate um, all of the security and privacy uh, aspects of the online delivery um, during the, um, during, in PISA's case, during the field trial and the main survey. And, and so there is an, a number of um, activities and measures, including the collection of some of the um, uh, log data and event data while the students are taking the test um, are, are being now considered for PISA 2025. Um, finally, robustness policies and procedures, they have to apply to um, in, in, in online test delivery to a student data protection. Um, we we're all aware that governments across the country and globe have been um, increasing the legislation for data protection. Uh, however, in the assessments like we have in PISA in a speaking test where students are, um, uh, with students' um, voices will recorded, 
those uh, concerns have to be um, of, of the highest of the highest order. And for, for that reason, uh, we are developing a, um, a whole new set of documents for PISA 2025 that talk about the data protection uh, policies, procedures, and that we are also, as a part of that process, talking about the security of all of the online systems that we are using. And because as, um, as Patrick and Mark have mentioned, um, every test delivery is not just the one system, it's a collection of system systems uh, and all of these systems that are part of the, the network have to provide a secure, uh, robust and resilient solutions for, for, the, for, the, test, for the test delivery. Um, last not least, we need to look at the support that we are providing to schools, to test administrators. Um, there is a challenge in providing technical support in context of international large scale assessments, simply because um, there, is a, there, is, there are often layers of test administrators. So um, ACR is an international contractor for PISA. Uh, ACR uh, collaborates um, in, in consortium with OIT, Capstan, he looks, um, and, and so we collaborate with national centers. The national centers um, often um, uh, have a, 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 a provider of services that is actually implementing assessment in schools. So there is a there is a um, that there are few steps between uh, us who are responsible for the assessment and the test administrators and students, and all of those all of these users have to come together and. Have to be um, have to be clear about their roles and responsibilities. It starts with providing students with a uh, user friendly interfaces in and intuitive navigations through the assessment. Um, it starts with the provision of comprehensive information to all of the all of the participants in this chain, um, to providing guides uh, for using online test delivery. Uh, platform safely and and effectively. So um, this is where th this is where um, this is where the online delivery uh, of tests, like any technology solution, really depends on 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 us, on our collaboration with the national centers, on a collaboration with a assessment experts and the test platform. Uh, delivery experts, uh, um, ACR and OIT, and obviously with uh, the OSCD, uh, who is overseeing um, this operation. And with that, I wish to say thank you and hand over um, the microphone to uh, Dr. Piancentini. Um, thank you, Goran. I'll I'll try to share my screen. I am hoping that the audio is fine. If not, please uh, please let me know. So thank you for uh, um, thank you for your invitation. I okay. Um, I think we are uh, we are we are we are all set. Uh, the title of my presentation is a rather long one, <laughs> Assessing Problem Solving and Self-Regulated Learning uh, with Interactive Resource Rich Task. So let me explain a little bit what is my plan today. It is to like um, talk you through uh, the assessment of learning in a digital world that we are implementing for, uh, for PISA 2025, but also more generally about our strategy to develop a new assessment of uh, 21st century skills. Uh, I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about the process we are like we are following and also the technologies that that we have developed and that we are using uh, for prototyping and developing uh, new typologies of tasks. So uh, it was already mentioned that uh, there is like there are many people that claims that uh, the, the type of assessment that we use also in the context of large-scale assessment like PISA 
uh, to tell, uh, to compare the success of education system are a little bit uh, um, limited. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the basic literacy is like the ability to read or the ability to solve mathematics or scientific problems are not important. I think they, they are going to remain important even with the advent of the artificial intelligence. However, they are just uh, not enough uh, to evaluate whether, whether education system and schools are preparing, are preparing young people for their, for their adult life, meaning for, like, for productive employment and also for, uh, for citizenship. So the, the big question is what else uh, should we assess? Uh, in the last year with, with my team, we have repeatedly made the claim that we think we should, we should really focus on learning skills. And by that, we mean like uh, students' capacity uh, to, to learn new things. The basic idea is that uh, schools can do a lot uh, to, to transfer knowledge and to, um, to make students learn a lot of, of subjects and domains. But uh, what really matters at the end is, uh, is about transfer. It's about the ability uh, to adapt and learn, learn new things because we, we don't really know uh, what kind of demands uh, that the world will put on our young people. So uh, this ability of adapt and learn is, is really the, the essential thing. So in terms of what, what we mean by ability to learn, uh, we mean essentially uh, the ability to solve problems uh, that you have not been exposed before and that are relatively open. So not all the type of problems and not really the type of problems that we are used to employ in traditional assessment, but really uh, open problems um, in a resource-rich environment, and we'll tell you more about that. Uh, we also need to assess the, the ability of people to regulate uh, their learning while they, are, they face these, uh, these open problems, and also their uh, capacity to make decisions on what uh, information to use and what to trust. And learning in digital world, the, the PISA innovative domain for 2025, is really um, the first uh, assessment that we develop <clears throat> with this uh, with this objective of focusing on on uh, on learning skills. Uh, the basic idea is that um, learning is a is a social process. So, in order to assess whether students are capable of le <clears throat> of learning, we have to simulate some authentic learning experiences. Uh, this means that uh, we need, for example, to provide to students some feedback because uh, whenever you learn in your life or solve problems in your, in your life, you're not really constrained like in a testing situations, but you generally try out things and you get feedback on whether you're ready in the right direction or you're making mistakes. So this idea of, uh, of interactions and feedback is really the crucial and the most uh, salient innovation of this of this of this new assessment. Uh, what we want to do is really to evaluate uh, whether students can learn new things uh, using digital technologies, using digital tools. But let me say a few more words on the on, on the constructs. Um, our belief is that if we uh, if we are able to construct um, like sufficiently sophisticated simulations of of learning experiences, we can assess uh, some like students' ability to apply uh, some specific problem-solving practices. And in the PISA assessment, we focus on computational and scientific inquiry practices. But we can also observe measures make sense of uh, self-regulated learning behavior. So uh, the type of the, the way students strategize and the way they adapt to the to the environment in order to uh, to learn better. In terms of the first dimension of the assessment, we have been developing task types uh, that really map into um, the type of, of uh, use of technologies and use of computers that are more productive in terms of problem solving. So we are mostly in the, in the sphere of what is normally called uh, computational thinking. Uh, we are asking students to decompose problems and recognize patterns. So for example, we can give them like a fairly uh, complicated uh, problems that is like sequencing these steps, and we are asking them to uh, to order these steps in the right uh, in the right way. Um, we are also showing to students how uh, computers are really essential in scientific investigation, and in particular in dealing with data 
and um, uh, creating model and making predictions. So uh, we have developed a set of interfaces in which students uh, can collect data uh, with computers and can try to make sense of, of uh, phenomena through experimentation and modeling. And finally, uh, we let them build some kind of computational artifacts. So a big part of the assessment task, in, the, in a big part of the assessment task, they go step by step toward constructing some kind of, of a computation, computational model, game, or tool. Uh, in this example, that is not actually in the test, but it resembles many of the units that we have. They have to be like some kind of executable computational model to make sense of how uh, a virus like COVID spreads and how uh, you can affect the spread of the virus by changing some variables. And then on the self-regulated learning side, uh, we are looking at uh, four main facets. The first one is whether students are capable of understanding how they are doing, and they take actions to actually monitor their, their progress and, uh, and to get us stuck. And uh, this is where like the resource-rich environment comes into play uh, because we are providing students like several opportunities for, uh, for monitoring their work. Uh, for example, they can, when they realize they are stuck, uh, they can consult work in examples and deans. A second facet is like evaluate knowledge and performance at the end of each task and at the end of the main uh, challenge task of each unit, we ask students to evaluate uh, their performance. And finally, uh, we are collecting data and we will be reporting also on what we call non-cognitive regulation processes that are essentially task engagement and the management of emotion. In terms of the features of this, of this assessment, we have developed with our colleagues um, at ACR uh, nine interactive units that they all have a, a learning purposes. So each unit represents an authentic learning experience. For example, they uh, they might like learn to uh, to pilot a, to pilot a simulation of a, of a of a shuttle that has to travel across planets, or they might be uh, trying to predict changes in a in a submarine ecosystem or planning an exhibition. In each of these units, the students learn to use a specific tool. And, uh, and so the units are structured as, uh, as learning experiences that start from learning how to use uh, this computational tool. Uh, this is the organization of the unit. Uh, each unit has uh, an approximate duration of uh, 30 minutes. And, the, and, and the, the unit is really structured as an online tutoring experience. Uh, the first thing that the students um, do is meeting uh, with a tutor, an online tutor. Uh, the first ask them to show that show 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 what they already know. So the quiz is a uh, is a test of pre knowledge uh, that looks like a traditional PISA test. So static, uh, it is as efficient as possible, and allow us to set like a benchmark of where the students start from in terms of the uh, domain knowledge. And then there is this learning phase that is made of a tutorial in which they learn step by step how to use these digital tools. For example, the, the tool they use for like programming uh, the spaceship or the tool they use to conduct experiments and collect data. And then they go through a series of learning tasks that are like four, uh, three to four uh, learning tasks in which they learn something useful, something uh, that they can apply to the challenge task that is the uh, main application. Uh, moment of the work. So essentially, uh, we check their knowledge. Uh, we spend like 15 minutes teaching them how to solve like a relatively complex problem. And then we present them this problem and we see how far they go. At the end of the units, the, there is a reflection phase in which we ask them to reflect on their performance and learning. Um, third feature of this test is, as I say, this, like this, this is really where technology really gets useful in terms of assessment. It's this capacity of like analyzing students' work and providing intelligent feedback that is adapted to the actual work of the students. So telling them if they make an error, so we can see whether they fix this error, or giving them the opportunity to check their work, for example, to check their model, and giving them feedback uh, that they can then can use to iterate and make improvements. 
Uh, the second, the, the, the fourth like uh, characteristic of this test that is also innovative in my own view is the fact that uh, um, we try to adapt to the fact that in a, in a test like PISA, we have an enormous variety of, of abilities. We have very, very, very proficient students and we have students who can barely read. So in this context, if we want to assess higher order skills, uh, we need to cater and adapt also to the fact that we have lots of students who have limited skills. And the way we do it is to, to make a, like a, a much more extended use of partial credit. So for example, when we give them a complex task like this one in which they have to pilot um, um, an automated car to these four um, stations, like the, 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 yellow, uh, the yellow bubble, we are not just considering whether the students like actually manage uh, to reach all these four, four bubbles. So uh, we are not using a dichotomous scoring, but we are looking at everything they do on the task. So even if they manage like to, to just move the automated car straight, it's already a demonstration that they, have, they are capable of doing something. So we are looking quite in depth at the process data to develop these scoring rules and to, able, to be able to differentiate students who have really and no ability and no engagement from students who have just like low prior knowledge and uh, some other issues that prevent them from completing the test. So in terms of the diagnostic that we can create, it will be much more uh, precise and, and useful. Uh, fifth characteristic, it's uh, all this work is based on uh, an evidence-centered design. So for each of the, of the items we define, uh, a priori, what are like the actions, what are the behaviors that we expect the students to take? So there is generally a theoretically defined sequence of actions that uh, we expect the students to take. In many of the tasks, there is not a unique sequence, but we can identify like some behaviors that are productive. And what we do is to compare this theoretical definition of, of behaviors with what we see in the data. And with the colleagues in SER, we have been uh, developing this like fairly detailed and sophisticated login system to capture all the meaningful data and to organize them in a in a format that enable analysts to make sense of this data. And then finally, the last uh, the last characteristic of this test, as I said, is the fact that we have uh, we are doing we are still using self-reported data, uh, but we are doing it in a different way from like what PISA used to do. So not a general thing, general questions that are asked after the test in the background questionnaire, but very contextualized questions. We are asking, for example, to students how they are feeling uh, just before, like after the learning phase, before they have to do the challenge task. And then after the challenge task, again, we ask them again how they feel. So we are also able to, for example, to investigate transition in affective states. Uh, so this has been like quite exciting work, uh, but it's also uh, extremely demanding and time consuming, resource intensive. Uh, we have started working on these items in uh, 2020. So it has been three years and uh, we are still not done. So this like basically tells you the story that whenever we want to get into this more like complex problem solving type of environment, when we want to assess a complex construct like self-regulated learning. There is a lot of design work to, to do. I'm, I'm grateful to Goran and the ACR teams that have been like available to work with us and with the experts to, to do like many iterations and to keep correcting uh, the designs and making also like relatively large iterations and changes in the design of the task uh, after each cognitive labs that we have conducted and after each pilot. Uh, but my main point is that uh, this takes a lot of time uh, to like you know to do things properly. So we will never be able like to to assess a lot of other things beyond like reading maths and science, and to do it properly if we just wait for the OECD uh, to develop a new test every four years. Like even assuming that we can do a proper job at each time, it will take an enormous amount of time. Uh, to cover all the types, all the domains and all the skills that we are potentially interested in. So the way like we discussed this problem internally, we thought we need some kind of more collaborative approach uh, to, this, uh, to, to this problem. And the first thing that we need to work on is on the technology. 
So the last in this last part of my presentation, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the technology that we have used for and that we have been using for a prototyping assessment task. So before we go to large scale and before we uh, we bring this task to many students, just starting from like experimentation. And uh, this is called a platform for innovative learning assessment. It is. Uh, it looks quite similar to what I just said of, about the uh, the Tau portal. So I build. It's not it's not Tau, but it could be easily integrated with Tau. So what it is is a is a free, completely open source tool uh, that we are using for for like prototyping our new assessment and for like making this assessment available to school uh, for a formative purpose. Uh, as we develop the new assessment, we also try always try to be theory based, so working with experts to uh, do as we do in PISA, starting from frameworks, from uh, learning progression co construct maps for the for this new uh, type of competencies. But the central feature is really this idea that if we create um, a fully open source and uh, and that is easy to use, easy to access. Uh, we can create a condition for like an international collaboration on the development of next generation digital learning and assessment. And finally, it's also a platform where like uh, teachers can create their own material, their own their own items, and share it with others. So the the general idea is that uh, the assessment that we have been uh, prototyping, developing in this in this uh, OECD platform. Uh, looks very much like the one that we have been developing for uh, learning a digital world. Uh, they are less constrained, like with PISA, we have uh, lots of constraints. For example, we couldn't go beyond 30 minutes. In a formative model that is designed for the classroom, you don't have many of these constraints. So you can get into more like using more sophisticated tools, for example. And, uh, and the idea is really the integration of learning and assessment. So this idea of a continuous assessment that many people talk about right now, uh, the students work on this, uh, on this assignment, on this assessment, they receive um, real-time feedback. Uh, the teacher themselves can monitor on a dashboard how the students are doing. And then uh, finally, there is uh, all this process we are working on in terms of like uh, what information we provide in the dashboard, and what, how we let teachers use these resources, these resources beyond uh, what we can provide from the outside. So uh, customization tools. Uh, we have so far developed three, uh, three applications. So uh, each targeting a specific, uh, a spe like uh, a specific set of domains. Uh, there is this first application that is called Carol, uh, that is up for computational thinking. Uh, students learn to code. Uh, the second application is uh, is Betty Brain, and the students like um, learn about a complex phenomenon and produce uh, a concept map, a model of this complex phenomenon to teach a virtual agent that is this uh, student Betty. And finally, the third um, the third applications that we have been developing is about uh, game design, and the students can do uh, all the steps of. Uh, of programming a video game uh, from designing uh, all the characters of the game and the environment to animating uh, the characters and setting goals for the game. And so the idea is, again, that this environment uh, um, let us like, um, provides like an engaging, interesting experience for students. They let students learn some meaningful concepts that can be linked back to the curriculum, such as coding concept, math concept, or scientific concepts. But they also give us all the information to, uh, you know, to also on this like more uh, sophisticated, diagnostic skills like self-regulated learning. And uh, much of the work we do around PILA is about producing indicators out of this complex process data and transforming them into this uh, type of dashboards and designing with teacher ways in which we can this dashboard that easy to interpret and use. And, and also, as I say, reflecting on how uh, this data can really be most useful for classroom work. Uh, so for example, and where AI sits in this process. I know that Alina will talk much more about AI. Uh, the only application, one of the applications we are doing for AI is simply like clustering uh, solutions of the students for each of these um, environments, for these experiences into groups so that for example, teacher can identify common mistakes among the students 
or come or, or like distinct ways of solving a given problems. And then they can organize the classroom discussion and reflection around these different solutions. So it's really about you know how we um, how we transform like a meaningful meaningful assessment for summative purpose to something that is similarly meaningful for uh, for formative work for classroom work. And uh, and finally this. For each of the environment that we created, uh, the idea is that we have been creating customization tools. So basically, uh, whatever items we have been creating with the experts, we expect that the teachers should be able to create something else, especially to connect better uh, the, the items to their own work. So for example, this is the customizer for the current world, for the computational thinking uh, tool. They can create any type of problems with any type of constraints uh, providing their prompt and providing their own needs. And they can also create sequences of tasks so they can decide whether they want to be provide like a single task experience or like a longer experience, experiences with some type of branching and also provide uh, different tasks to different groups of students for our personalized learning. And, um, and this is work that has I mean, still in its infancy, but the, I would say for us, the most exciting part of the work is the, the fact that we have been able to work uh, directly with teachers and get a lot of feedback, for example, on the dashboards. So this is all I had to share about our work. And of course, uh, yeah, we're very excited to see that uh, our LDW items have been successfully integrated into uh, Tau. Um, and we, we already have some data from the pilots, but of course we are very <laughs> excited and waiting for the for the big data to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, and thank you, Goran. Um, looks like we have a few questions, so I can just go ahead and read those off for you. Um, so the first question we have is what technical technological measures will you take to prevent unwanted behavior? Uh, so we're developing a range of measures, so I, I won't be going into details, but they basically include uh, preventing students from using shortcuts to uh, you know, copy and paste, uh, blocking students from uh, using a screen capture um, to share the test items, for example, and then there is a, a, a range of other um, solutions that we are currently working with our colleagues in OIT and that, that we will be um, um, very soon sharing with the participants in countries. And um, this is going to be a journey together uh, to make sure that the PISA 2025 is secure um, um, both for students um, and, and for the test material. Great, thank you. Oh, and I just wanted to mention too, if anyone's having any troubles uh, using the chat, please feel free to use the Q&A and drop your questions in there. Um, uh, we have another question. Is the OECD uh, platform uh, going to be using PCIs? Yes. So we are using a PCI uh, to develop a, um, a sort of interactive simulation type items for science. Uh, for uh, wrapping up all the existing items. I think this has been one of the challenge um, that we have been um, uh, grateful with to our colleagues in OIT that we managed together to find a way to uh, make the existing, the old piece of material an open source using a PCI format. And obviously the learning in digital world uh, um, tasks are also uh, done as a PCI um, uh, format. Very interesting. <clears throat> and um, another question too, the piece of innovative domain has been a great platform for exploring new item types, new ways of measuring skills and competencies. Do you see these item types going mainstream, um, for instance, becoming part of the regular PISA tests? Um, and being used in national formative summative tests? I will defer this to Maria. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, think Maria is, is much this, better yeah, place to is, answer that no, question. This, yeah, this is mine. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the innovative domains have a very complex story, and that story that has longer life than my life in this <laughs> in the in in this role. So I would say not not all of them. Uh, uh, the general directions that uh, we are taking now over the last over the last years is to increase connections. So uh, if you think about like the tasks that I showed you about on learning a digital world, like many would see that these are uh, these are tasks that. In terms of domains, they are very much about science, uh, like STEM plus C, star science and computational thinking, because what the students do is like uh, they demonstrate whether they can design uh, some kind of digital artifacts, like a game or a, or, a, or can just like program uh, something, or they can do investigation using data. So uh, these like you know, could well behave like and belong to the uh, to the main domain of, of of science so it's really about like doing one one leap uh more and say like from the very basic simple simulation can we use simulations in which for example the type of feedback uh, that we give to the students on their work is more uh, is more nuanced uh, there are some characteristics that are very specific to to the things that we assess and are not yet in the in the main domain framework so all this emphasis on on self-regulation, like led us to include all this like opportunity to learn inside the assessment, and this might be something that you know might be not something that you want to include in the main domain. So uh, frameworks for PISA evolve, but they evolve relatively slowly uh, because there is this huge uh, and you know justified um, attention to trends. So so this is this has been really like what has one big component that has slowed down change in PISA and uh, as a consequence also in other programs, uh, this, this very much great focus on trends. But you know, some aspects can be definitely integrated. For example, like for the next uh, for the next innovative domains, one of the ideas is to work on, on online media literacy, so to make students work into an authentic like search task on the web or or to like uh, the spot and judge like fake news. And this is like, as I see it, it's the natural extension of reading, of the reading constructs to the media and digital world we live in. And again, so the connection is getting tighter with respect to the past. So there are more chances of integration. That's my uh, end line. That's great. Um, and we have we have several more questions. I don't know that we'll have time just in the interest of uh, you know the schedule if we'll have time to get to all of them. But um, we'd love to you know follow up with several of these uh, via email. But I'll go ahead and ask a couple of the quicker ones. Um, so, what kind of offline solution will be utilized for assessment? So it'll be a USB based or a hybrid version. So we are developing solution that that is based on the on the packaging assessment and using a um, one computer to uh, to take the role of a server. Um, so getting the computer into the school uh, and then get the school uh, laptops to link to that computer um, via simple by USB uh, sort of Wi-Fi modem. Um, that, that you can get um, in, in most of the countries. And in this way, um, the students are connecting to, uh, to the assessment uh, through the browser in exactly the same way as the students were doing the online assessments. So that's what is, was important for us to make sure that we have very similar experiences. So students will not see the difference between an online and offline version of the PISA 2025. Test. Great. And we have some questions about which version of TAO will be used, how we'll connect uh, TAO for adaptive testing, and we can absolutely answer those. They're just a little bit longer. We can answer those um, in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, but we are creating customized uh, TAO solutions. Um, and then a question regarding the interoperability between solutions. What challenges have you experienced and lessons learned? Well, I could answer that question in regards to integration of the existing PISA test um, material into TAO platform. And we were able to solve this challenge in using the 
using the QTI and open source format, such as the PCI. So I think that again stresses the importance of us having the the open source format um, and standards, and they are um, they they provide us a tool to integrate the existing and new PISA assessments, um, including learning in the digital world. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just just to say that you know interoperability challenges are still very very big <laughs> and uh, pci is one solution but it's not the, the it's not the final solution so um uh, uh it's uh kind of a of a compromise to the to the fact that especially in the, in the field of like more innovative type of environment and testing it's it's very hard to to get into um into some kind of a common practice and consensus on what it takes to you know for example on all, all these like new environments that we are uh, we are integrating in our own platform pila uh, what it takes to to, uh, to make it possible that for example they can work on they can work on tau like our uh, in this space of like you know where where like the design is much more like innovative and the and the items looks more like a learning digital learning experiences more than traditional items they are not really like very a very clear criteria. The approach that we're using is using very modern web technologies like you know, Vue.js and uh, and and similar, so that we know that people will un <laughs> will understand. And uh, and of course, yeah, putting everything on GitHub, uh, but it's still like an open question to me uh, and something that I would I would be very much interested in exploring, whether like some someone can take. Uh, you know, Betty Brain or like or our like Karel uh, environment and bring it to DAO or bring it to the to another system. We know how it works for QTI, uh, for like you know, for the others is still PCI, but it's still like in terms of like uh, other forms of like integrations that make it possible to change things. And it's it's still like uh, I, I say it's still like a territory in which we we have to do much more. Makes sense. Um, okay. Thank you guys so much for your time for the both of you. I don't think we have any uh, time to get to the rest of the questions, but like I said, we will follow up in the Q&A and get those answered for you. Um, so uh, it was great to have this presentation, Goran, Mario, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go you. ahead and introduce our next uh, speaker. So we have uh, Dr. Uh, Alina Von Devier here from Ad Astra, and she's going to give a presentation on the role of AI and um, assessment in the age of AI. So Dr. Von Davier is the founder and CEO of Ad Astra Tech LLC, which offers a uniquely integrated set of educational services designed to provide personalized insights for lifelong learning from elementary school through career. Um, and Dr. Von Davier is a highly sought after keynote presenter at private, national, and international events for various organizations and esteemed thought leader in measurement and ed tech communities. And her team actively uh, participate on board of directors, policy and research panels, advisory roles, and through presentations, books, and research papers. So I'm happy to turn it over to Alina to give you a bit more background and get into the presentation. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank Mark for inviting me to be part of this event. And it's my pleasure to share some of my work and my team's work with all of you. So the title of the presentation is obviously uh, part a response of uh, what's happening right now in the world uh, with the impact of AI on everything we do, especially on education and in assessment. But it's also a reflection of the work that Duolingo as a company has been doing actually for uh, well, since its inception, since Duolingo is a tech company and uh, pretty much everything uh, Duolingo put together from the learning app to the learning, to the English learning um, test, the Duolingo English test uh, is based on AI and computational models. So uh, with this, um, I want to talk a bit about the type of uh, uh, 
topics I will discuss today. I will talk about the outreach access and test securities as motivations for some of the work that we've been doing, which, as I mentioned before, go independently of the things that are happening now, the hype and, and concerns that are happening in the, in the society. I will talk about digital first assessment or native, digital native assessment. What is generative AI? What problems are we actually trying to solve with AI and automation in assessment? And I will discuss engineering principles and generative AI and automation for test development, scoring and quality control. I will also refer there to what we call the item factory uh, that we put is a system that together with my team, we put in place to be as efficient as possible um, in creating content for assessment. So obviously uh, this is not new for anyone at this point. The world is changing quite rapidly actually, uh, although for some of us who have been in this uh, um, more interested in the effects of AI and uh, computer science on statistics and psychometrics, it's um, the change is not as dramatic as for it is for most other people. Uh, we need to rethink what education is about. Uh, we, we need to have a system or systems that are resilient to global events that can handle digital immediated life and that are able to integrate technology and AI in ways that are responsible and fair. So uh, on digital testing in general, uh, the impact of the global events has been quite significant. And this is what spurred the largest wave of digital innovation in language testing uh, where, we, uh, or where we are active. But this is also true for other types of assessment. Um, the number of digital tests available, their recognition, the test taker volumes, all of this have been uh, uh, connected in ways that were uh, difficult to anticipate before that. So one of the things that we believe in, and we look, of course, to our collaborators and others that share these uh, ideas, is the, the concept of outreach. As the world competes for the best international talent, it needs to have scalable tools that can reach students where they are and be resilient in the face of turbulence and, uh, and growth. So what does it mean for um, assessment? I mean, it's obvious, it was obvious, uh, that traditional assessments were just not resilient to this type of turbulences. Also, another thing we care uh, about at Duolingo is the, the concept of access. We need to make sure that we are pulling from a broader number of countries and also within those countries from all levels of society and not necessarily just those students who can afford the price tag. So many of you might have heard the story of our founder, Luis Fonan, uh, who is from Guatemala and had to travel actually to a different country to take an English test. And uh, that ex uh, experience, which was really difficult, uh, stayed with him and became the motivation for the Duolingo English test. So what exactly are we trying to grapple with? Uh, one of the problems that traditional test development has, and again, this is only one of the problem, but it's a big one, uh, is that developing tests is extremely time consuming. It's expensive and prone to validity and security breaches. And the process in general means that you have experts written test items, then you have different types of pilots. Most of often you pay those people to take the, uh, the test, try to do some psychometric analysis, but again, you are constrained by the sample sizes that you have. And then you start putting items in the pool and you cross your fingers that those difficulties that you estimated with those limited pilots will actually still um, man be maintained in the real population of test takers. So this is not gonna work nowadays uh, and it's becoming more and more clear that that's just too difficult, too expensive, too slow. So putting all these things together, I'll. Duolingo decided that it's a good time to do the tests in a different way. And um, 
now we, we see that other assessments are considering the same approaches or alternative approaches, but in the same uh, direction. So digital first assessment are actually a good solution for this new normal. Um, and this is true in many ways because they provide the opportunity and the facility, if you want, sorry, I have dogs. Um, they provide the infrastructure for, uh, uh, for automation. And again, I'm trying to point out here that at least at Duolingo, much, a lot of this work started well before uh, what happened uh, with the pandemic or with, a, you know, chat GPT now. But similar type of work I've been doing also with my previous team at ACT Next, um, and uh, and I did try at ETS before I left uh, also to build this type of tools. So it's not that these things have just, you know, show up uh, this year because everyone is talking about AI. So some of us, uh, many of us actually, have been involved um, deeply with these technologies and trying to improve the development process. So what are digital first assessments? Um, they are native uh, digital. They are born digital. They uh, allow for digital immediated construct. They are designed with computational models and AI algorithm in mind. They are theory-based evidence center like all the other ones, and they are as valid and as reliable as the, as the other one. They need to be. This is definitely a, a, one of those constraints that is a given and it has to stay. But what's special about them is that they are integrated. The infrastructure is fluid, and I know that uh, Tao platform is building many of these affordances, trying to make the infrastructure as fluid as possible and make it easy for others to build their test in a digital first uh, fashion. Uh, it also includes uh, theoretical frameworks that work very well together uh, alongside with different automatic tools, such as the, our item factory, uh, generating item, reviewing items, and scoring uh, test, the test takers' responses. Another special characteristic of this assessment, and it's also consequences of them being online, is that they have a superior test taker experience. They should have. That's, a, that's another very strong requirement and constraint for everything we do, for example, in my team. Every decision that we take is uh, uh, reviewed through this filter, whether it improves or uh, makes the test experience more difficult. Um, so what that means is we want to make it easier for test takers, available on demand, anytime, anywhere. And it's online uh, uh, administration with remote proctoring. And I want to emphasize that at Duolingo, we have a human in the loop everywhere. Um, it's not necessarily true for other uh, thing, other assessment, and it's also not necessarily true even for us in the future, given how uh, well these new technologies are developing. But right now we have a human in the loop uh, in, in the system. So getting back to the topic uh, of AI, let's talk very briefly about what is AI and what is what we are right now dealing with. So originally it was defined as the simulation of human intelligence in machines. But how intelligent were these, um, well, algorithm, these this, uh, programs? And people came up with the Turing test. Um, right now we turn that around and we have uh, tests for humans show proof that you are not a robot. Um, so there have been approaches in the past that might not work really um, anymore for the type of um, technologies we are encountering. Anyway, intelligence by itself is actually very rare. Um, intelligence in machine is very, very rare, uh, at least in the way we think of intelligence. Uh, they are only as smart as the underlying code and the data that they have. That being said, the, the technology is just amazing and uh, it has a tremendous uh, potential. And 
we we see we hear people talking about AI. It's really more used as a terminology uh, that's very general, and it includes so many activities from robots, automation, data analysis, recommender systems. So a lot of things that are actually extremely, you know, focused on specific tasks, which again means it's not intelligent in in a large uh in in, in a sense uh, in which we talk about intelligence but they are extremely useful and they are extremely use useful especially when they are embedded in ecosystems uh that provide and a fluid uh, infrastructure so generative ai is that part of ai the newest one that uh, took us by storm uh is that part of of AI that creates new things based on um, data, large, large data sets that were available uh, to very few companies, they were um, able to create, to, to rearrange the older type of knowledge that they had and create things in a probabilistic way that look like new things. Or in a way, they are new things, but again, keep in mind they are based on uh, all the information, say, up to 21, at least in the case of chat GPT and GPT-4. So, and this generative AI actually is um, possible in many areas, in the area that in computer science people talk about sensing, where computer vision audio processing comes in, or in the area of comprehension, which actually has mostly to do with knowledge representation and NLP analysis. And then our usual analysis of big data, uh, which include machine learning, but also our old fashioned statistics and psychometrics. So what makes the difference from all of these technologies that existed before and what we have now is that this huge transformer-based computational models have been created and they are in each of these areas, actually, in the sense, in the comprehension and in the analysis. And you can, as you all know by now, uh, we can create new things in language, um, in text, in uh, translation, in images, uh, modif modifying the voice of uh, humans or, or characters, creating videos, and so on. So it's a quite powerful system that uh, we have now to figure out how to uh, work with and how to make sure that what we create is both responsible uh, and fair. Well, definitely, we are all impressed about what's happening around us and a bit nervous about uh, all this uh, all this power. And, uh, you know, we behave very similarly to Ludits. We behave all very similarly to, um, you know, uh, other, uh, our ancestors in different times when they had to deal with new technologies. So this is normal uh, to be both um, excited and afraid uh, in, in dealing with these technologies. And if we look at the adoption curve, for ChatGPT alone, it's really the most impressive technology ever. Uh, within um, you know a few um, a, a few months, it, it became really popular. But there is also a lot of unfortunate hype. So first, people are so impressed and they start using it for very inappropriate. Um, applications and they are really impressed they think it's it's super intelligent then they notice that it's a probabilistic system and sometimes it does poor predictions um and they get a bit upset because they realize that it creates problems and you know uh, makes up stuff but then if they really start to uh, put an effort in understanding how it works and apply it properly, they will realize how useful it is and, uh, uh, and how much you can do with it. So what problem are we trying to solve in assessment in, with generative AI? Primarily, and this is the topic of this presentation, is how to build a large item bank to support a valid and secure digital first assessment that is administered on demand and at a very, very large scale. Again, I, you've seen this picture before, traditional test development, 
So what we are trying primarily to do is to replace this square there, which is time consuming and expensive and the pilot samples may not represent the target population. So we created the item factory, which is intelligent automation for content development. And it is based, uh, I spent quite some time actually reading about um, industrial principles and what is called the fourth industrial revolution principles to reconceptualize, uh, reconceptualize the process of test development at scale. Why is that relevant? And why did I look into manufacturing? Because they, the problem we are trying to solve is how to manage both humans and machines. And this is why I look into manufacturing because they made uh, uh, quite a significant progress in integrating um, automatic tools. So for us, the problem is how to accelerate the item production while maintaining and monitoring the quality. And again, we are leveraging the theoretical assessment frameworks um, but also the engineering principles and the tools that we have. So these are the principles that this item factory is using. System thinking, explicit flow, pattern identification, identifying characteristics of transfer points. So what's the input and output in different places? This is actually extremely uh, relevant. Identifying the human touch points, make those easier, make those smoother, uh, and make sure that the information gets transferred, uh, human management with emphasis on efficiency uh, and quality control, M metrics, identifying the right metrics, developing the right uh, visualization tools. So what's the vision for the item factory? And I, we have two perspectives. One is the assessment science perspective. The other one is the engineering perspective. The item factory blueprint is, as I mentioned before, keep the human in the loop. Uh, but And it, then it includes different modular pieces that work together. One is design, the digital first assessment design, either at item level or at the test level. And here again, the traditional tools are extremely important, validity, reliability, accessibility. The second is, now that we have the design done by scientists, how do we generate this content at scale? The next one is, how do we review that content at scale? As I pointed out before, we also learned that AI can make up stuff sometimes, and that is not always of good quality. So the review is still needed. And then, of course, human management is relevant. But also, after you have a lot of content, how do you manage that content? How do you keep it up and going while the test is being delivered anytime, anywhere, uh, all uh, the whole year? So uh, we need a way to manage that. And then we need a quality control system, which we called uh, analytics for quality assurance. In our case here for the pool is called for item pools, but in uh, we already have a system. I, I think that was the first thing I developed at Duolingo was a quality control system also for scores and we call it Aqua Analytics for Quality Assurance in Assessment. So now we will have two, two systems that would work with each other. One is for um, people, test scores, and the other one is for items. So let's go quickly through each of these uh, blueprint elements here. So the first one is the design. Uh, we, we did publish, by the way, we have papers on our website about how we think about this system and what's the science behind it. So what you see in this picture is uh, the learning and test taker experience. So we make it bigger. It's not only about assessment. It's also about learning, the way we think about it. Uh, we value the impact. So we always evaluate uh, the impact that our test has, especially for test takers in the world, but we also want to support different stakeholders such as the universities um, and uh, office admission officers. So we are focused on access, delight, and the social cognitive factors. We want to make the test and the testing experience less of an uh, um, obstacle and less of a stressful uh, experience. 
behind the uh, the hood we use different frameworks theoretical framework we use a language assessment framework because we are a language test we use a validation and measurement framework particularly we use the extended evidence center design it's a it, it's a concept and the framework that um uh, my team at ACT Next actually developed a few years ago. And then it's a validation and measurement computational psychometrics that some of you know, I've been working, uh, introduced the concept in 2015, and I've been working on uh, in this uh, uh, framework, methodological framework since then. But one difference from our test and others is that we consider the security framework as part of the design. We don't think of security as something that comes at the end of the test. And uh, we think security needs to be um, included in all the parts of the assessment. And then here on the right, you see all the um, tradition, more or less traditional um, validity claims that, uh, that we have. So how do we do that? Creation at scale, we want to use the humans and the machines, and it's a task that is hard for both the humans and the AI. So the way we do it is have the humans design it, then have the machines scale it up, and then have the humans back and reviewing it. How do we do the creation at scale? I believe this is what most of you are interested in. Um, we used or uh, started with GPT-3 and BERT, then uh, Jack GPT, then nowadays we use GPT-4. Uh, these are all for text, uh, but also stable diffusion and others uh, for images. We also use some technology nowadays for our newer task where we have characters uh, that speak. We use a, a particular technology for their voice, for the speech to text. Uh, and, you know, to make sure that the voice works uh, appropriately. So fill in the blank vocabulary questions are type of questions that we do with these technologies, multiple choice keys and distractors. Uh, we use initially BERT for that part. Now we are slowly moving to everything being done by GPT-4. Um, free response comprehension questions, writing and reading prompts, dialogues, and images. Here is an example on how we use GPT-3. This is a task that we launched last year. So obviously we started using these technologies um, in 2001. Um, so obviously before the hype uh, was around us. And we use GPT-3 to generate uh, text and then we use BERT to generate questions and distractors. Uh, what is GPT-3? Uh, it's, it's a transformer model, and it can mirror the style, the format, and the content given very, very few examples. And we have a paper, I suggest, again, check our website if you are curious about any of this, because we do write about the type of things um, we uh, propose, and we publish them. So here is an example where there are three inputs that uh, we gave, sociology, business, biology, with different titles. And then we asked GPT-3 to provide text on medical technology. Notice that none of this example was on medical technologies. And yet GPT-3 at that time was able to create the history of X-ray, the evolution of medical technology, and the use of computers in medical research. So this is quite fascinating and obviously very powerful since we only gave very few examples, none of them directly on the topic, uh, and yet it was able to create uh, you know, multiple examples of something new. So how do we integrate this powerful technology. And this is the system that we use. Uh, we start with assessment and planning, the extended ECD here. Um, then we have this machine learning NLP modeling to generate items. Um, then we have this loop here where we do a pre-piloting uh, on which we do uh, psychometric modeling. This is the equivalent of A-B testing in, in tech companies, just that we do it on um, with consent and on our own uh, research platform. 
And then only the items after the items have been revised and they are of quality, of decent quality at according to some of the metrics, they go to the human review. The items are reviewed for quality, for a fact check, and for fairness and bias. After that, we do a large scale piloting and, um, sorry, and then uh, they, they go on uh, in the pool. How do we review the content? This is, uh, we use several steps. We have an automatic review where we filter the problematic content. That's not quite enough, we realize. So then we have an item quality review done by uh, experienced editors and, uh, uh, and content uh, experts. Then we have a fact check review and then the fairness and bias. Who are our experts reviewers? They are um, people who have experience in applied linguistics and in English as a second language. <laughs> and we also provide training and rubrics for identifying um, fairness and bias issues. For example, the type of things we are concerned about here are mostly things that are, say, too American, as opposed to content that is understood by uh, anyone in, in the world. The FAB reviewers have diverse backgrounds. Uh, and they also have uh, experience and interest in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Now, uh, we also need this human management uh, that is uh, done uh, through both human managers, but also uh, a lot of technology. So we actually have only one human manager managing uh, the, the reviewers uh, where we have so the metrics are extremely important here that we look at individual metrics and uh, performance metrics. Then I mentioned before the item microservice is, um, is important for uh, helping us track the journey of each item. So they are an architectural and organizational approach to software development where the software is composed of small independent services that's communicate over API. So in this case, what that means for us is that, you know, uh, we can track each item as in different stages of the development, and then how many times, for example, was administered. That gives us an information about exposure. And then I mentioned this, this is actually not quite finished. Uh, we are still working on it, analytics for quality assurance for item pools, but it's gonna be um, like the other one, like Aqua that we already have. Uh, it was gonna be a continual system that evaluates the metrics that we decide on, and they will need to reflect the quality and the health of the item bank. And it's important that it provides alerts to us um, on a weekly basis or whenever something is out of the bands that uh, that we indicate. So um, I would like to discuss now the work that I presented um, to uh, repeat uh, some of the messages that I think are relevant from my presentation. I would say probably that the most important one is that creating assessments directly online and intentionally considering from the design how these technologies can be helpful is really uh, important and it makes one's life it's extremely much easier than anything else. I think all the traditional assessments who try to pivot during the pandemic by taking what they have and putting it online, online they realize that that's just not working. Um, another point, I hope it remains with you all, the audience, is that the item production can benefit from AI, from automation, and from engineering principles. Um, another one is that not all content needs to be AI generated. Um, you can still have humanly generated written items, but I believe the processes that we are putting nowadays in place, this item factory could be uh, useful for others as well, especially the principles behind it. At the moment in 2023, I would say my lesson is that Yes, generative AI is extremely powerful and it still needs human review. 
Uh, good human expertise and management are continue to be very much needed. And while the factory has been developed for our specific needs, the principles are generalizable. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, it was fascinating to hear about kind of all the ways AI can really transform efficiencies in assessment, especially while not necessarily removing the human aspect. Um, please, anyone, please feel free, like I mentioned, to drop your questions into the Q&A box. If you're having any troubles with the chat as well, you can drop them right in here and we can read them out and uh, answer live. So it looks like we have one question. Um, could I ask you to explain a little more about what it means for assessment infrastructure to be fluid? Yeah. Um, so what I mean by that is that it has to allow for different inputs and outputs in a very uh, flexible way. So from a programming perspective, that will mean, you know, some of the basic, like not programming it in fixed uh, uh, with, you know, um, Black, bl blanking now on the terminology. So making sure that you have all parameter based that you allow for um, uh, for this uh, change in input or output. Um, it also means that the way we have, for example, the way Duolingo scale up the the platform for testing to be able to deliver anytime, anywhere. Um, this also requires a uh, a degree of flexibility and uh, and fluidity in a way, a, a flow of delivery uh, that is quite sophisticated and is not easy to achieve. But I believe that if people make that um, uh, their goal, I, th I think it is uh, doable. Uh, I don't have here any uh, drawings for this, but we've been, we have actually a lot of blueprints and engineering approaches even to the item factory, but also to other parts of the platform that indicate how things, you know, like take one item, what's happening with the item journey throughout, um, throughout the system, take one person, what happens with that one person throughout the system. Um, so we try to anticipate what type of um, blockage or uh, where the system might go wrong or might, might uh, crash uh, and, uh, and modify that and make it as, um, um, as, as nimble as possible. So also we think in a modular fashion. So everything that can make the delivery fast, that can allow for tools to be plugged in, plugged out, as, so those are uh, elements of fluidity. So that from a test taker perspective, everything is a smooth experience that they don't notice any of, that it's going from one type of platform to a next type of platform. For example, from delivery to, um, from the survey at the, before the test starts to the delivery of the test to the post test survey. And then another question that we have is um, fast forward to 2025, um, for instance, chat GPT version five or six, do you think the human element will still be needed? I believe so. I believe that the humans uh, are needed for design. I believe that um, humans will still be needed for fairness. Again, you know, if we turn that uh, Turing test uh, around, and we probably will need to make sure that the assessment is appropriate. Um, so yeah, I, I believe humans will still be needed. The job might be different, but I believe humans will be needed. I, I think that's, you know, hopeful for our future, that human intervention will still always be hopefully needed. Um, so another question, just a follow up from um, the question about fluidity um, or kind of more of a comment. It would be really interesting to hear more about how you use AI for those free response comprehension questions for marking and scoring on those must present some real challenges. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not trivial, obviously. I That was not part of my presentation, uh, but again, check our website. There are some papers there as well. Um, we've been working really hard on the scoring part and it's not using any of this um, generative AI. So it's actually a model that you it's we build it and it's it is machine learning uh, based and statistic based. Uh, and we will publish about that as well, but it's not using the generative AI for that. Okay. And um, do we have any additional final questions? Uh, we still have a little bit of time. Yeah, I mean, I was also thinking that for, since someone asked about will the humans be needed, um, mm -hmm. I was, it made me think that we need to think what are the skills that humans will need uh, in the future. And uh, I strongly believe that what makes us human becomes more relevant. For example, uh, critical thinking, creativity, uh, these are communication, collaboration. So these are uh, definitely uh, skills that we will need and we will also need not only for the human to human interaction but for the human to machine this this element of critical thinking and creativity so um, I would you know like for example uh, I, I work with a group called Makat and uh, they have a critical thinking masterclass to teach this type of skills and they also have an assessment and I believe that they are working with uh, Tao to get to build the assessment online uh, for yeah. thinking so I think that's that's how I see it I believe that we will need to continue the traditional education of course but there will be skills that will be needed um, that we are not explicitly teaching or at least not sufficient in a sufficient manner Got it. So more of those like softer 21st century skills. Yeah. I mean, I don't know actually why they are called softer. They are so hard to measure. Yeah, right. <laughs> hard to teach, so hard to learn, but yeah. Got it. Great. Um, I think that wraps it up for questions. Unless anyone has any final thoughts, um, please feel free to drop them in. But if not, you can always send us an email too, and we can you know, help get that answered for you or help get you connected. Um, Alina, thank you so much for your time. It was a really interesting presentation. Really great to hear kind of, you know, about all of this transformation happening in education. Thank you for having me here. Have a good conference. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye. We have um, a few minutes before we get started in our next session. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start introducing our next speaker. So we have um, Dr. Anthony Benners from the New York City Department of Education, who's going to be discussing the uh, language, the world literacy and language assessment at uh, NYC schools. So he's going to dive into kind of how new technologies like Tau, um, the system that they use are going to, or are, you know, influencing transformation in education across the district. Um, and as Alina had mentioned in our last presentation, uh, she had mentioned working with Macat, and that is someone we will hear from in the afternoon as well um, for a presentation on critical thinking. So, <clears throat> to get started, Dr. G. Anthony Benner serves as a senior psychometrician and innovation advisor for the New York City Department of Education, where he leads research and adoption of assessment innovations in test design, scoring, and technology, and advises on the, uh, the quality of content, psychometrics, accommodations, security, and administration of educational assessment programs to support the effective teaching and learning in New York City public schools to promote the adoption of modern educational technology and data 
and data systems, as well as the teaching of digital literacy. Dr. Benners has been a tireless champion of the digital transition of the NYC DOE assessment programs to help foster global competence among youth in the culturally diverse global city that is New York. Dr. Benners has worked to enhance the NYC DOE's World Language Examination Program, taken annually by over 40,000 students in 20 plus world languages. So we're going to take just a few minutes and I'm going to go ahead and put up Hi, Anthony. How are Hello. you? Hi. Uh, good morning, afternoon. Yeah. Uh, can everyone ready? hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, great. So I think, are we ready to get started? Yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I was just pulling up, uh, in, we needed more time, but absolutely, let's get started. Sure, fantastic. Uh, so I'll share my screen here. Great, wonderful. So just to uh, introduce uh, my talk here. So the the title is uh, Tr Digital Transition Strategies for New York City DOE World Language uh, Assessments. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, just some thoughts uh, that uh, I have uh, about uh, how uh, we can use TAL uh, to uh, further our goals uh, as a public school system uh, to improve uh, digital literacy uh, among our language learners and how that coincides with some of the uh, uh, standards and expectations that we have uh, for our students in New York City who are learning uh, various languages uh, other than English. Uh, so uh, I'm going to share some background context about our world language exams, the program uh, that we've been using uh, TAL4 and transitioning from pencil paper to digital. Uh, briefly mention uh, the uh, revision of uh, state standards uh, that uh, has really spurred uh, our system to action uh, and uh, really wanting to uh, focus on uh, language instruction in our city and how can we uh, use technology uh, to better improve what's happening in the classrooms and then uh, focus on some of the uh, frameworks that we have been using here uh, to go about this digital transition. So New York City, you probably heard of us. Uh, we are the largest school system in the US. Uh, we uh, actually uh, are akin to a state system in many ways. We actually have 32 uh, different uh, community districts that uh, the New York City Department of Education serve. Uh, New York City, uh, of course, is a, a global center for, for so many industries, media, finance, marketing, fashion, uh, and the like. So we really consider ourselves a, a global city. And when you look at the, the demographics of the students uh, that uh, are in our 1800 plus schools, uh, they come from a variety of different backgrounds uh, and speak uh, many, many different languages. We have each year a language survey that uh, we send out to parents and uh, the data uh, suggests that over 180 languages are spoken uh, among our families uh, in their homes uh, here uh, in New York City. Uh, so a very diverse uh, community. Uh, and again, uh, given uh, our global uh, influence, uh, you know, it's very important for our students to uh, learn to connect with one another, uh, to embrace their heritage languages, as well as uh, give opportunities uh, for students to learn a second, in some cases, a third 
uh, language. And so we're very excited at the New York City Department of Education to be offering language exams in over 22 languages. Many of those exams we developed in-house working together with uh, world language educators. Uh, and you can see here uh, just a breakdown on the right-hand side of this slide of the number of examinees that we have fit for each of our exams uh, each year. Uh, so altogether, it's between 40 to 60,000 uh, students that are sit sitting for our world language exams. Uh, and uh, it's, this is across middle school as well as high school that we offer these exams. The exams have traditionally been uh, administered on paper and still we have some of our exams that are on paper and we're working to transition those to a digital format. And so I'll share here uh, just what, how we're doing that. So uh, first I wanna set a little bit of context. Uh, New York State uh, has adopted uh, a new set of uh, teaching standards for world languages. And uh, in those new standards, uh, it's focusing on these three big shifts. One is uh, looking at proficiency frameworks that are not just specific to New York State, uh, but really uh, are national uh, and international frameworks that are uh, informing uh, our expectations of uh, uh, language proficiency for our students as they progress through uh, learning uh, a language in our uh, in our classrooms. Uh, the, the second big shift is really wanting educators to focus on purpose and context as they uh, instruct students and guide them to build proficiency in that second, third language. And then the third uh, shift uh, is uh, really wanting to improve the digital literacy of our language learners. Uh, just recognizing that we live in a digitally connected world, that uh, the primary means by which we communicate today is through uh, these communication technologies. And so this is really an opportunity for our world language educators to, to engage and motivate our students uh, to learn a, a new language and communicate with others uh, through uh, technology. So some of the key skills here uh, are keyboarding in a second language, uh, but then also how do we use this language in a respectful uh, way uh, using things like chat and uh, video uh, and critically evaluating social media as well. So uh, why does New York City uh, value uh, this shift? Uh, to digital world language exams. Well, we've got many benefits uh, that are very promising uh, here. One, uh, just as alluded to with the previous slide, uh, digital world language exams align uh, better to 21st century skills. Uh, there's a number of different operational uh, benefits as well, uh, including the ability to improve uh, the nature of the content, the delivery of the assessments, uh, as well as the scoring. Um, with regard to uh, equity and access, uh, many of our uh, what we call lower incident languages uh, where there may be fewer students sitting for the exam, we uh, have traditionally asked them to travel uh, across the city to uh, what we call a hub site uh, rather than sit for the exam at their school. And that was uh, large, in large part because of the paper uh, pencil uh, approach, but also because uh, the listening portion of the exam required there to be uh, a speaker of that language to be able to uh, read aloud the prompts for the listening. But by recording those prompts and digitizing it and allowing for home schools to administer for their one or two students who might be speaking again, one of those less commonly taught languages, uh, this uh, enables more access, greater access uh, to the test and doesn't uh, require that travel burden uh, among uh, uh, the, the students themselves. Uh, so many, many different benefits uh, to this transition, which we're excited about. Uh, how are we going about this, this transition? So we have some frameworks that we're working from. 
here. One of them is uh, the SAMR model, uh, which maybe you've heard. Uh, this is a model that is used uh, when discussing just general adoption of, of technology within classrooms and how might uh, we uh, see progress in teacher adoption of, of technologies in the classroom. So uh, the first step of, of that model is substitution, where you simply uh, are taking the technology and it's not really adding uh, an extreme amount of value in the beginning, but it's really a substitution of what's being done uh, currently, right? That's, I think, largely what happened during the pandemic, where a lot of the teachers were taking maybe what they were providing uh, on paper as worksheets or assignments and the like, and they, they transitioned those to digital versions, but they were maybe just uh, on Google Drive as PDFs or scanned versions, or maybe even Google Docs, right? That's just a strict substitution. But then the next step uh, is augmentation, where you do begin to add some additional functionality uh, to the uh, uh, to the work uh, through the technology, and then finally modification and redefinition uh, are again additional steps where we're adding uh, additional functionality. So we've been using this as a framework, thinking about well, where do we start with substitution, and then uh, have the field. Uh, become familiar with the technology and then add more additional functionality uh, year after year. Likewise, another uh, framework that involves working directly with our educators is design thinking. Uh, and here, again, the idea is to uh, give some prototypes to educators to be able to work with, get feedback on those, and then rapidly iterate uh, and make improvements. Uh, to the uh, uh, to the assessments, and then we've got lead user innovation, where we're working uh, with a subset of our educators that uh, already have uh, a certain inclination to use technology, has some familiarity with technology in their classroom, uh, and then that's a real source of innovation uh, on the assessments because those are folks who are really hands-on can give us a, that first blush look. Uh, and uh, we can, again, rapidly uh, improve before we scale out to uh, the rest of the field uh, for that wider uh, adoption. So this is uh, an illustration of, of what this model, or the FAMR model, looks like in practice. Substitution here, an example is just simply taking our multiple choice questions, which would normally be answered through the Scantron bubble sheet, and putting those on screen, right? Uh, with augmentation, this year what we've done is we've uh, asked uh, students to, uh, rather than handwrite their responses to the uh, writing section of the exam, uh, we're having them type. So not a huge transformation, but it is uh, adding additional functionality. And then as for years to come, uh, again, we're going to be looking at our models and thinking about, well, how can we add additional functionality as we go along? Um, talking about keyboarding, it's really interesting, even myself, as I've undergone this, uh, working with uh, educators uh, through this transition, have learned more and more about how uh, one uh, types in various languages. Uh, talking with my colleagues, uh, many of us, uh, we had a chancellor uh, a few years ago, uh, Carmen Farina, who had the Inya, the little swiggly line ab above uh, an N in her name. And funny enough, many of us at Central would, uh, we didn't know how to type that in. Where did you find that? So uh, we would go and find Carmen Farina's, the chancellor's name somewhere in a text, and then we would copy and paste over that in. Well, no longer do we have to do that because now we, we know how to type uh, the Spanish diacritics uh, necessary uh, there, and that's through the U.S. International Keyboard. So this is one of the things that we've introduced to our schools now is uh, the U.S. International Keyboard, which allows for uh, us to type in uh, various Romance languages, the Latin-based languages, uh, and find those diacritics. Uh, there above the, the traditional QWERTY keyboard, but we still we don't have to learn a new keyboard layout. So that I think is going to be very transformative in terms of 
uh, the next generation uh, learning to uh, to type uh, in those Romance languages. Uh, as we move forward, uh, some of the things that we're going to be looking at incorporating in these assessments is the use of technology enhanced items. Uh, so uh, in our reading section where it's currently uh, a reading passage and then a series of multiple choice items, uh, looking at uh, some of the graphic interactions within TAL and how do we have students interact directly with uh, the regalia and with the uh, passages and various infographics that would be in the target language uh, to make it uh, even more uh, interactive. Uh, you know, one of the other ideas is, uh, uh, again, uh, wanting to uh, dovetail uh, this uh, shift in world language standards towards uh, a greater emphasis on having students imagine themselves in a situation where they're using the language, right? Real world situations, uh, you know, that that is the key to, to learning new languages is, is immersion and comprehensible input. Uh, how can we transform the assessments so they somewhat mirror that? It's a simulation of the real world and uh, taking advantage of Cal to create scenario-based tasks uh, is something that we're also exploring uh, for the future. I personally am very excited about uh, the advancements uh, in uh, AI technology, and I think that holds a lot of promise as well uh, for the future of world language assessments. So uh, one of the things that uh, I'm wondering is you know, what other enhancements might we have in store as uh, these uh, technology, technologies become uh, more pervasive in classrooms. So uh, one idea is the use of uh, voice typing. So I mentioned keyboarding and that being a shift for some of our students and even our, our colleagues here at Central uh, learning uh, a keyboard in, in a different language. Uh, but now we have voice typing. So uh, is that an important skill for students to be able to to learn in addition to uh, finding the diacritics on the keyboard, taking advantage of uh, the voice typing uh, tools in, for example, Google Docs. Well, could we have maybe a portable custom interaction within PAL that allows for students to have the option? Maybe that's substitution, right? Uh, so you can keyboard if you like, but here we have a tool maybe in one of our tasks that allows you to uh, voice type. And then that's also, I'm finding, uh, a, a very uh, useful uh, way for students to practice uh, speaking uh, in that language as well. Uh, and I intended a presentation uh, by a colleague who is actually using automated uh, speech recognition uh, with their students learning Mandarin to be able to uh, hone in and, and improve uh, their tone uh, as they're learning uh, that second language. And you see here speech visualization being used uh, in uh, modern world language classrooms. Might that be a tool that we could use in the assessments to help augment uh, and support uh, the educators that are rating student uh, speaking performance within our speaking classes? And then uh, also uh, the idea of, uh, again, as these chatbots, chat GPT and the like uh, become uh, more uh, used in the classroom, uh, might we uh, look to that technology to create some sort of chatbot or a way in which uh, students might be able to interact with an agent uh, in that target language and we could uh, glean from that uh, data uh, that might be useful in evaluating their proficiency and what, what comes next for them. So there are some potential challenges, of course, and I do want to mention those. Uh, for the students, again, you know, uh, this is a shift, so they have to practice uh, typing, especially in our, some of our lower incident languages where, uh, you know, the keyboard uh, is not uh, the traditional QWERTY one that's in front of them, but uh, it's uh, a very different uh, keyboard 
uh, and so they uh, they definitely have to get used to that. Uh, potential challenges for the school district themselves is supporting uh, this transition with additional staff and processes, system integration, single sign-on, uh, making sure our data is secure, uh, and the like. And for the schools as well, uh, making sure that they have the devices necessary, which is not so much a problem these days having enough devices. It's just more of the hands-on work that has to uh, get done to prepare those devices for uh, the administration. So we're working through these challenges uh, and uh, we're very excited about uh, this uh, future that we have uh, in store for us. Uh, so with that, I, I want to uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, feel free to contact me uh, and continue the conversation. Uh, if you have thoughts, ideas, ways that we might collaborate, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, great presentation and great to hear about all of the uh, work going on at NYC schools, um, especially with the open source uh, platform. Um, like Anthony mentioned, we have some time for questions. So if you wanted to drop any questions into the Q&A, uh, we can go ahead and answer them for you. Um, anything to ask Dr. Benners or anything um, that you're looking to learn a little bit more about. Just give it a minute or so. Um, and if there are no questions too, like we've said, we can always follow up with email if anything comes up uh, that you think of. But we'll give it another minute before we um, prepare for our next session because we do have a little bit of time and I want to um, you know, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. So we have uh, one that just came in it said, um, so thank you, Dr. Benners. Does the NYC DOE use AI-driven workflows to produce the different language versions of the world language assessments? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have not uh, used uh, AI for uh, you know, automated generation of, of item content uh, yet, uh, though I think there's some real promise in that. I mean, I have certainly played around with ChatGPT and and others, uh, and uh, you know, it's it's pretty impressive as like a, a, a first draft of content just to ask that GPT, hey, give me a, a question in Spanish related to this text. Uh, so I, I think there's some real promise, and I think maybe this summer we could work with our educators uh, in that regard. Uh, yeah, because I think that uh, it would be. Uh, a real uh, help uh, to the uh, authors uh, to have that, again, first draft. I don't know that it's going to be the final. I don't think you can just ask that BGPT, just give me the whole test and that be it. But uh, I definitely think in terms of giving something that the educators can work with to hone, uh, it's really cut out a lot of, um, you know, that kind of some of the ideation uh, work that might uh, happen in the beginning, uh, we can streamline that and really get into, all right, how do we take this content and uh, finalize it uh, to the next step? Right, and kind of going off of what Alina was saying earlier to just having the systems that allow you to have that human review as a seamless process, um, very, very interesting. Okay, um, do we have any other questions that anyone uh, wants to ask before we um, transition? Well, I think we will leave it there. Um, and of course, feel free to drop any questions into the Q&A we can get back to you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Benners, for a great presentation as always. Um, thank you for, for sharing those insights with our audience. Wonderful, thank you all. Thanks, Alex. All right, have a great day. So we're gonna, uh,
you know, before we transition to our next session, uh, I just wanted to um, let you know that we have a little bit of time. So I'm going to just put up before we have our next speaker, which is um, going to be presented by Salah Khalil of Macat. So let me just go ahead and share my screen for the meantime while we get that session prepared. Oh, and whenever you're ready, Sala, too, I'm happy to introduce you. I know we're we're running a little bit ahead schedule, so it's fine. Whenever you want, so just let me know. Okay, yeah, we can dive right in. Um, I think that makes the most sense. So um, I'll go ahead and introduce Sala here. He is, um, Sala Khalil is the um, founder of Macat International Limited, and he's a social entrepreneur with a track record of achievement, achievement that spans commercial enterprises and not-for-profit organizations, as well as public service and policy development at government levels. Um, as the founder of Macat International, the company whose powerful methodology and online tool set are radically transforming the way critical thinking skills are taught, learned, and embedded in universities and educational forums throughout the world. Following three years as a consultant to the CEO and board of the Westminster, uh, Westminster Foundation for Democracy, he additionally founded the Alexandria Trust, a London-based charity dedicated to restoring world-class education in the Arab region. So with that, I'm happy to turn the presentation over to Sala uh, to get started and dive into uh, assessing critical thinking skills. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Mark, for inviting me to, to this event, which has uh, been very, very interesting, uh, really amazing presentations and uh, very hard acts to follow, I guess. So um, yes, uh, I'm going today to be talking let me first start by sharing my screen. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about critical thinking, uh, basically one of the, the most important 21st century skills. And I'm just, uh, I'm just gonna start by just really stepping back a bit and, and discussing the basis for what we're doing this, why we're doing it and and what it entails but before i do that i just want to set the stage and and talk about um where does this fit in the bigger scheme of things the starting point is obviously we've heard quite a few speakers um talk about artificial intelligence including alina as well it's it's obviously there are many views on artificial intelligence whether people are excited or concerned about it they, they end up seeing it as a strength, a weakness, opportunity, or threat, or, or, or some of the above. There are basically most of the, the narratives fall into predominantly one of two scenarios. One scenario is a superfluous human being where AI takes over everything and you have universal basic income. And the other scenario is citizen cyborg where it, it is a scenario of hybrid intelligence or what is called augmented intelligence, which is a combination of human and artificial intelligence. We are obviously in Macat, we're interested in the second scenario. And um, this is a scenario where everything will be powered by augmented intelligence, essentially where human choices are going to be made using data analytics. Uh, so for example, if you're looking at descriptive analytics, trying uh, data sets to find out what happened, or diagnostic analytics, uh, why did something happen, or prescriptive analytics, why should we do next, what should we do next, and predictive analytics, what might happen in the future, all those will be uh, driving, you know, they will be driving the way decision making and choices are being made in the future. And these require a certain form um, of, of skills. We don't need to imagine such a scenario because the reality is, and, and that's um, basically uh, kind of a common consensus from all thought leadership in the world of education and employment, OECD, World Economic Forum, uh, Accenture, PricewaterhouseCoopers, they all point out to a crisis that's going to happen in 2030 that's going to affect 1 billion people. 
um, predominantly, this is one in three uh, people in the global um, workforce, which is 3.7 billion. And if unaddressed, this uh, skills gap or skills crisis will cost the global economy north of $30 trillion. So this is a huge problem, really. And the, 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 the reason for this happening is a, the gap between old economy skills and new economy skills, skills that are not going to be easily replaced by AI. And not only that, but also skills that are going to help human beings develop and augment their uh, hybrid intelligence. Again, there is quite a, a, a strong consensus on the skills of the future, and they are what they call the four C's, which is critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. But for MACAT, we are focused on communication and collaboration with machines, because we believe that this is actually the, these are the skills that are going to help build hybrid intelligence um, and, and move it from strength to strength. We also believe that critical thinking is the foundational skills of most of those skills as well. And this is the skill that we're starting with. Um, and if you look at the work that we've done since 2009, you'll find that we spent quite a bit of time trying to understand um, you know, the literature on critical thinking in the, uh, in the in academic fields. And you can predominantly find the largest body of literature on critical thinking in, in three disciplines, philosophy, psychology, and education. And I don't mean to give like formative definitions here, but just to, to basically uh, transport the idea that philosophy is more about envisages critical thinking as perfections of thought. So the perfect critical thinker, the best critical thinking. And psychology is more interested in the actions and behaviors critical thinkers do. And education is all about information processing, where you have like a sort of a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid is uh, regurgitating, and at the top is analytical comprehension. And although these three disciplines have different definitions on critical thinking, they agree on two main points. The first point is that critical thinking is a set of skills and dispositions or behaviors. And the second point is that it can be taught and it can be assessed. Based on this, we Macat worked with the University of Cambridge to try to uh, ask um, to ask the, ask the University of Cambridge to do conduct a survey that asked about 150 professors, 50 from each of these disciplines, what are the skills that make up critical thinking? We stayed away from dispositions because obviously dispositions are quite a sophisticated and complex um, uh, set of uh, constructs to build assessments for. So we, we decided to focus on skills. And based on the survey, uh, University of Cambridge came back to us and said that uh, actually we found consensus um, with the, you know, within the, the uh, academics that we've asked about critical thinking or the skills that make up critical thinking on uh, something called the Pacier definition of critical thinking, which is uh, defines critical thinking as the component skills of problem solving, analysis, creative thinking, interpretation, evaluation, and reasoning. And under these, we worked building on the work of University of Cambridge. We, we then worked to define the four most important sub skills under each of the main skills to create what we now call the PACER framework, which has six main skills and 24 sub skills. Based on the framework, we use the process, which is test, teach, and track. And based on the process, we create a three product, which is the PACER assessment, the PACER library, and the PACER masterclass. If you look at the PACER assessment, this is an assessment, an online computer-aided assessment to uh, measure critical thinking. It's 24 questions. It has accessibility options as, uh, as well uh, in, in terms of how it's offered. It's offered on a platform. And uh, obviously there are assessment features for it, just like any other uh, assessment um, uh, system that you use or assessment platform that you use. The 
Each question comes with an image. It comes with a sort of a small passage. And then it has a number of, um, it has a question and then it has a number of answers. And the questions vary from drag and drop to single multi-choice, single choice to multi-choice questions, uh, fill in the space, et cetera. So, so this is a one hour assessment that gives you a sort of a baseline of your profile and how you can actually uh, understand what your base year uh, profile looks like. The second sort of product is a pace here library, which is analysis of seminal works across 15 subjects in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. We have created about 220 titles that analyze these great books. Um, these are the books that you would read if you're studying any of these disciplines in the top universities in the world. And the analysis, uh, to create the analysis, we worked with about 750 doctoral graduates from leading academic institutions since 2014 till today. We also, uh, the library is now uh, carries the brand Rutledge. It's translated into Chinese and Arabic. And uh, University of Cambridge also did a trial, another st study on the library and found that the library actually improves critical thinking and comprehension by up to 12% per day. The library is a multimedia library, so it comes with uh, you know, academic content that is in, in digital format, uh, print format, audio format, and video format as well. The last product and, and is Masterclass, and the Masterclass comes in two, form of, uh, in two forms. The first form is a um, a master class that is domain general, and the second form is a master class that is domain specific. The domain general master class. This is a very big topic in in the teaching of critical thinking because there are sort of two schools of thought. One says that critical thinking should be taught as a standalone topic, and the other says that critical thinking should be taught within a specific subject because you require a certain level of subject knowledge to be able to think within a certain subject, for example, engineering, medicine, and, and the likes. The most important thing for us is obviously the assessment. Uh, the McCats assessment is, is really important. And, and, and this is, we've spent a lot of time making sure that the assessment uh, has, um, you know, really high quality items and the model works. And, in last year, we signed a contract with OECD uh, to build the next assessment for measuring critical thinking and creativity in global higher education using both the model of the PACER model and the OECD rubrics as initial frameworks from which would emerge a third framework that we will use in building this assessment. It's a five phase project that starts with reviewing both models and, and seeing the alignment and the gaps between the models and the gaps within assessment in the market as well, and then building a bank of items and then piloting the bank of items and then uh, basically building the higher education assessment and then the final report. What is most important about this is uh, the the topic of automated item generation, which Alina had alluded to. So basically what we do in this is we are working today to see how we can use AI to generate um, a large item bank or large question bank and power the assessment that we have um, by using a large high quality item bank. The process is starts with sort of a, a traditional authoring specification design, and then uh, it goes into prompt engineering and then AI piloting, then you have to review and adjust. And once you have one design set after a number of mini pilots, then you can start to go into a, a, a larger uh, psychometric analysis pilot before you start mass production. And this process, continues and you can see here as an example you know the cost of a traditional assessment versus uh, using an item bank that can generate you know large scale uh, number of assessments this is our 
just wanted to introduce you to the board as well, because it's important to see that we are kind of guided by people who have spent a very long time of their careers in assessment and uh, predominantly also English language assessment. So Mark Anderson was formerly Pearson testing, Simon Liebes was formerly Cambridge assessment, Alina is currently head of research at Duolingo, and Fatima Dada was Pearson and currently Oxford University Press, and Lord Knight was the Minister of Schools and Minister of uh, Employment as well. Now, the reason I say all this three last slides is to tell you is, is basically the reason why we decided to move to Tao uh, as a platform. I mean, they, they do provide us with a number of elements that uh, basically other uh, sort of platforms that are existing in the market do not match precisely what, what they can offer. Plus, uh, the relationship with um, most of the people at, at Tao has been very um, productive and very positive. We're just starting, so I can only tell you my experience from what I've seen and um, but I just recently heard about the merger, so obviously we're we're hoping that that doesn't change, uh, you know, the the relationship that we we currently have with Tao. But again, um, having a platform like Tao, you can obviously have more of a sandbank uh, of items. You can basically pilot a number of items. You're not kind of stuck with a, a, a single set of items, or every time you want to change an item design. You, you have to go back and, and, and you know, uh, write code to do that. So, so this is something that was very attractive for us um, in, in Tao. We obviously had, uh, had some um, more demands in terms of reporting, but Tao was very helpful in terms of directing us of how to go about this. And, and we worked with them to, to try to develop this as well. So, so in general, I think if you're sort of trying to automate your assessment or digitize your assessment in a way that uses AI, I think you need a, a strong platform and a strong partner. Most importantly, our work with OECD uh, makes, you know, Tau the natural choice, obviously, um, because they have already worked and are going to work with OECD going forward. So that, that, that was also a very, very strong uh, reason behind why we wanted to do that. So I'm not going to take a long time because I'd like to allow more time for questions and discussion, if that's possible. But just simply telling you that we are, we are, a, we are a small company. We've got reasonable size investment. I mean, we've been, uh, our investment exceeds $35 million, but we are a very ambitious company. We've worked specifically and very uh, sort of focused on the development of critical thinking since 2009 till today. And, um, and that's, that's, I guess, was one of the reasons why we are now working with OECD. And uh, obviously one of the reasons we are choosing to work with Tao as a long-term partner. Thank you. Thank you, Salah. That was a um, very informative presentation that you shared with us. Um, and we want to open up uh, some time for questions. So please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Uh, should have access to uh, write anything in there. Um, and we'll give it a moment to see what populates. Um, we can always answer them live. Okay, let's see. So uh, we have one question that just came in. Who is the PACER assessment geared to? Is it uh, K-12, higher ed, or professional? This is a very good question. We, we started out with, with K-12 and developed it into a higher, higher assessment, higher uh, education assessment as well. And we're hoping to also develop it in the corporate world. But our main focus is K-12 and higher education, um, and those are the ones. So we basically um, have, been, have and are doing 
uh, a lot of pilots with schools and universities in the UK, in Europe, in the, in the US, and also in the Arab world as well. I mean, one of the contracts that we have is currently with the Egyptian government to measure and, uh, and develop the critical thinking of more than one and a half million students over the next five years. So we're doing large scale trials with governments or ministries, if you like, and then small scale trials with schools and universities and larger scale trials with university groups or school groups or associations. So the, the, it's, it's going our work with OECD to help us increase the level and reach of pilots across the world, obviously. And then it, it, uh, we feel privileged to be working with OECD to build the next instrument to measure critical thinking and creativity in global higher education. And again, this whole work will be the foundation for our next two skills that we aim to measure as well, because the work with OECD will you know, take my cat's work on critical thinking and extend it to creativity. But once we have those two sort of done properly and well and up to a, a global standard, then we are going to focus, um, you know, uh, put a lot of effort and resources on developing communication and collaboration with machines because this is going to be a skill that is going to be required in a world that it will be predominantly dominated by hybrid intelligence. Yeah. Yes. Um, and just to follow up on that last question, would this also apply to the Pacier Library? And the Pacier Library was built from the, from the start as a critical thinking tool. It was basically the idea there is... Um, critical thinking has been imparted by elite, elite universities such as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge for many years through the works, so through the study and, and an analysis of seminal works. So they read foundational works. You wouldn't find someone in Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard reading a textbook. They always read original works and they analyze and critique this original works. And the reason for that is the original works is written by a great critical thinker, someone who has actually come in, challenged an old theory or presented a new area for research or uh, wrote a completely different paradigm that linked two unconnected uh, disciplines into a certain area. So they're really, as you would call them, they're like super critical thinkers. And if you study their work, then you can, you have the ability if you study this work to understand by contagion critical thinking. And that's what is called Im implicit critical thinking teaching. But in MACAT, we decided to make that even more explicit. So the library is more about the implicit teaching, although there is explicit uh, uh, markers to show you which critical thinking skills you're developing as you're learning through the library. And also the ability to have different formats, like video formats, audio formats, so, so can help a lot of people with varying learning abilities and 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 disabilities. So so it's it's really we when we were thinking about this, or when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how can we actually bring what people who who are spending two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get a a degree or a master's degree at Harvard, how can we bring these great uh, body of literature to the masses at scale, but also with affordability? So the idea is, is, is building this body of knowledge is not necessarily the knowledge is what we are seeking, but actually the thinking that brought about this knowledge and how uh, working with our library can help improve your critical thinking across a number of disciplines. Because as you as you also realize that AI is going to to basically challenge the old educational model. I mean, you have in in um, two basic models. One is the on the on the T model. If you like, the upper side of a T is the subject, and then how deep you study a subject is the stem of the T, right? You can go to multiple PhDs in one topic or one subject. And the industrial model revolution, uh, the industrial revolution model, sorry, uh, was more of narrow and deep. So you take one topic and you specialize in it. The knowledge economy 
paradigm is more uh, wide and shallow, but the new economy paradigm, which is powered by hybrid intelligence is going to be wide and deep. So you will need to know more about more disciplines and you will need to know more about more issues and you will need to know more about more sectors to make yourself more employable and to build a career that's going to benefit not just you, but your family, society, your country, and hopefully some for some people, the world. That makes sense, yeah. I mean, especially we can see how careers in data analytics and data science have really kind of proliferated over the last you know, 10 years or so. Um, and one other question that we have is, uh, do you use adaptive assessment? This is the this is the next part. So what we're using, why we're using AI, we're not just using AI for the assessment. So we have three uses for AI. AIG, which is automated item generation, ACG, which is automated content generation, and ATG, which is automated translation generation. Those three will work together to create an adaptive assessment and learning experience for users regardless of whether the user are in school or the users are universities or they're working in a job or they're running a, a government. So basically there will be specialized tracks uh, and these tracks will be uh, differentiated through the master class series. The library and the assessment are foundational things. They basically tell you where your skills profile looks, looks like and how do you actually build that. And that's a very interesting concept because intelligence before you just have an IQ and you live with it. Uh, critical thinking and these four C's are more of a versatile thing that you can continuously develop. And as you develop them, you open up more opportunities and you make better choices and, and, and so on. So that's, that's, really, that's really what it is. So I would say that the, the goal for us is a fully adaptive uh, learning and assessment experience, uh, but that's still about maybe a year down the line, um, and hopefully uh, working with Tao will help us get there, because I know that their adaptive uh, assessment side is still under development, I guess. Okay, do we have any other questions for um, Sala here? Um, please feel free to drop them in. And if not, we can always follow up via email as well. Um, we're just running a little ahead of schedule, but if, uh, you know, that's great. Okay, I think uh, I think we'll give it a minute. And if no more questions, um, I want to thank you for a great presentation, uh, for sharing all of those insights, for really diving deep and kind of explaining the different facets of the program. Um, it's very interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks for this. Thank you. Oh, one other question. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> one other quick question. Did you have uh, Chat GPT take the Macat creative thinking test? <laughs> yeah, this is this is something that's very interesting. Um, uh, you see, Chat GPT has scored highly in most of the the tests because it's based on knowledge. The Macat's test is based on how you think. So it's not a, it's not about it's not a knowledge based test. It's it's actually a test that measures specific skills on how. So it, Chat GPT will not score very well. We haven't tried it yet, but we'll definitely try it. But we know that from our experience on large scale or high stakes assessments that we've done with let's say fifty thousand students or thirty thousand students, we we have the ability. You know, students have the ingenuity and creativity of cheating on tests. So they try to find loopholes into specific tests. And even if students pass around questions and there is item exposure, what we found is that students who actually have the questions even before the test struggle to answer properly because you need to you know, focus and think. So the type of, I would say that the type of items that we are developing in MACAT and people like us, like ETS or ACT or CLA plus, you know, I think those type of questions are quite difficult for something like chat GPT to do. Maybe it won't be difficult in a few weeks time. I doubt it, 
but I I um, I I think it's it's probably more challenging than knowledge based questions. Okay, um, I think that was our last question. Um, and that's great to know that chat P GPT, you know, can't take that, <laughs> that test. There's some limitations there to it. Um, so yes, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it was, like I said, a great presentation and any questions that you have um, in the audience, please feel free to leave them with us and we can follow up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And you. Thanks. Okay. Um, before we turn things over, we're uh, going to get started uh, in just a few minutes. So before we turn things over, uh, I just wanted to take a quick uh, break while we wait for our next session uh, to prepare. We're going to be hearing from uh, Jean-Philippe Riviere of the uh, of Wicked, and he uh, is a developer, a GeoGebra developer, and he's going to be showcasing some of the or the GeoGebra PCI that is uh, available uh, to in part math simulations into assessments. It's also available for tab. We'll pick back up in about three minutes or so. Um, if we're ready to get started, I'm going to introduce Jean-Philippe, um, and we can go ahead and kick off that presentation. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Let me grab your bio. So Dr. Jean-Philippe Riviere is a highly accomplished professional with expertise in linguistics, cognitive psychology of reading, and educational research. He obtained his PhD from the University of Ardescartes, Paris v. Soborn, apologies for my pronunciation, uh, in 1995, focusing on the sociolinguistic inquiry of identifying illiteracy. This groundbreaking research culminated in the publication of his PhD thesis titled L'Estream La France Caché in collaboration with the pre prestigious Le Monde newspaper, which was published by France 
Gallimard editions. In addition to his PhD, he possesses several other qualifications, including a Diplôme Universitaire de Technologique in Marketing, a Master of Linguistics, and a DEA dedicated to image sem semiotics. Dr. Jean-Philippe Rivière has demonstrated exceptional development skills in a wide range of programming languages and technologies, including PHP, JavaScript, HTML, jQuery, GitHub, Python, C Sharp, and 3D modeling and graphics. His extensive experience as a full stack developer and his contributions to various organizations highlight their expertise in software development. His professional experience includes working for the Ministry of Justice Penitentiary Administration, where they created and worked on the National Jail Assessment Organization for French prisons, focusing on identifying illiterate inmates and proposing educational actions. He also served as a project manager for the Ministry of Defense, overseeing the National Assessment Organization on reading skills for young French individuals. As a research engineer at the CNRS, the Center National uh, de Research Scientifique, and collaborating with DEP, the National Ministry of Education, Dr. Riviere conducted reading education surveys and evaluated school systems, contributing to educational research and policy development. Dr. Jean-Philippe Riviere has extensive teaching experience, having taught linguistics and semiotics for 12 years at a prominent institution such as the University of Paris, Paris de Sorbonne, and the School of Speech Therapy in, of Paris. As a developer, he has created many portable custom interactions for ta the Tau platform, among them the SNAP PCI, the S EtherCalc PCI, Electronic Circuit Designer PCI, Blockly, Chatbot, File Explorer PCI, Wonder Choice, and most recently, the GeoGebra and Scratch PCIs. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jean-Philippe. Um, again, at the end of this presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. So please feel free to drop those into the Q&A box. And with that, I will hand it over to Jean-Philippe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it possible to share my screen? Hello? Yeah. You can share your screen on the little green button. Okay, I put this screen on. Hope you, you can see it here. Yeah. Sorry for this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you to to have me uh, this afternoon away with you. And uh, so um, my name is Jean-Philippe Rivière. As you uh, as you've heard, I'm uh, both a, a linguist and a developer, and uh, I'm also a consultant for a digital assessment. Um, these last years, I developed many modules for different uh, countries to enrich the way they uh, assess uh, pupils or students. My main activity was with uh, DEP, the French Ministry of Education, and uh, with a uh, uh, very nice partner, Thierry Rocher and Saskia Kespec. Um, we worked together for a while, and uh, I thank DEP for its trust during all these years, and uh, it's a very long, old collaboration. Another long co collaboration is with uh, Tao, and uh, I want to thank uh, Patrick Pichat for, for the invitation and the Tao team. Um, it's a uh, it's it's a while we are working together and uh, today I will present you um, the more particularly uh, the GeoGebra uh, PCI. Uh, voilà. um, but uh, shortly, uh, I think that may, many of us uh, 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 knew. Uh, but uh, I, I have just to remind uh, what is a, a PCI. A PCI came out from. Uh, the idea of the standard to organize content uh, involved in the assessment. Uh, to build a standard, first you, you need to, to define the most uh, common ways uh, of uh, assessing through recurrent uh, interaction named uh, common interaction. You can find them uh, in the Tao editor. You can find the choice interaction, order, association, and so on. But, but once um, uh, they, uh, they design the paradigm of uh, common interaction. The standard uh, creators uh, 
that were uh, at, at this time was uh, IMS Global and now its name uh, One in Tech, um, decided to open the possibility to any kind of interaction using the PCI concept, a, a sort of else category. PCIs offers the possibility to include in the assessment uh, process interactive animation, applications, uh, simulations, complex stimulus. PCI can be uh, mixed with all the uh, all interactions. In Tao, a complex item can be the sum of many uh, interactions. PCIs can be combined with uh, other PCIs, so the solution has, uh, has no limit. Um, a PCI uh, in Tao platform is organized in two ways. That's uh, the little tech moment. Uh, a, a PCI is, is one part is an XML uh, QTI structure that contains uh, the JavaScript applet. And on the other side, uh, it, it is built around the widget uh, container that solves the relation uh, with the platform and all the connection problem with uh, the Tao platform. So you, when you are developing PCI, you must have in mind this, uh, these two, uh, these two ways to, uh, yes, to develop it. Uh, as a conclusion, a PCI is a module that can contain uh, an applet, uh, the applet you need for your assessment. Um, now, uh, there's my, my website, I think, on, on your screen, on your screen. Wait. Yes. Um, so uh, th this is the Wikipedia web website. Uh, it, is, it, it gives you a, a view of uh, what uh, I did these last years. And um, there is many, many uh, PCIs I, I developed. And, and uh, we recognize this one. I saw the the, the picture in the in the previous uh, presentation. Um, so um, a, a clear example of of uh, PCI is, for example, Snap. Snap uh, is an application uh, here. Um, it's is an application um, created uh, at uh, Berkeley uh, University, and. Uh, Snap is a programming tool and to learn how to, to, to develop uh, uh, programming, pro programming skills. Um, what does it, uh, uh, the, what, uh, how uh, can I use that uh, in Tao? Easy, uh, here we are, we are in Tao, I'm creating an item and here um, you see uh, in the custom interaction, here we have the common interaction, so the, the defined interaction, and here we have a uh, whole the, uh, the the new interaction that can uh, that I have developed for part. And I did not this one, no, no that does not me. Um, so uh, the snap interaction is uh, here, and you can drag it and put it here. It's coming here. It is. So you see, my work is to take some complex application and adapt it, uh, the widget and the, the, um, the JavaScript uh, uh, engine uh, in, to make it work in Tao. But not only uh, working, but also I, I try to adapt it, uh, playing with option, creating some um, shortcuts to uh, make it uh, easier and, uh, and useful. Uh, so, um, this one is uh, is snap. So you see, uh, you, you can just do like this and use it and and create like this some some program. Um, uh, I, we did also the the, the chatbot. Here's here's a, the chatbot with uh, with Depp. Here the the, the chatbot. Uh, you see, you can import. Uh, uh, a complex tree and create uh, uh, a context for dialogue and resolve situation. And for example, uh, we, we worked with uh, on the subject of uh, critical uh, uh, thinking. And um, so the, the chatbot is around uh, dialogue. So it, it is very, uh, very rich and the potentiality of creation is, is huge. And um, also uh, another kind, 
the, the circuit, you see, you can create and edit uh, an electronic circuit here, drag in and, and dropping with, uh, with the options you need. And uh, let's go let's go now to uh, to show what is GeoGebra. Uh, you know, of course, some of them, uh, uh, some of, of you uh, know already uh, uh, GeoGebra. Uh, the GeoGebra PCI is uh, is very very important because uh, the GeoGebra PCI um, can offer. Uh, a lot of solution uh, to create uh, assessment in mathematics, but not only in mathematics. Um, GeoGebra, uh, first of all, uh, to have a clear idea, because uh, usually I, I'm speaking uh, about that at the end, uh, let's start with this. Uh, GeoGebra has a license, a special license, but it's a free tool, completely free. All the, all the work I'm showing you is completely free and you can go and download from my GitHub or for GeoGebra, you can download it uh, uh, from uh, the GeoGebra uh, website. Uh, or you can go on, on my website on Wikweed and follow the link and you will reach uh, the, the link in, uh, in GeoGebra website. Um, GeoGebra, so uh, as a, a special license, it's a free tool for students, of course, for pupils, uh, free for public education system, free for any uh, free educational context. Uh, for private context, uh, context uh, you, you have to contact them and, and study uh, a solution. But uh, usually, for, for example, for French education in France, uh, it's completely free. Uh, the PCI is exactly the same license as uh, the application. Um, I want to say that the GeoGebra Geo team is really great. We are working together since uh, almost two years, and uh, I thank them for their kindness and the, the way they helped me to, to create the GeoGebra PCI. We, we started two years ago with a GeoGebra PCI uh, built on um, the old uh, PCI model of, uh, of uh, OAT, and now it is completely compatible with uh, the new generation the TAO uh, advanced uh, requirements. So um, if you need more information, don't hesitate to contact the TAO, the GeoGebra Geo team, because they are very nice and they will uh, help you. Um, voila. Uh, let's have a look. Um, first, maybe you, you are asking how to, uh, uh, to, to get the GeoGebra um, how to put GeoGebra uh, in um, the, the Tau platform. To, to do that, uh, there is uh, two ways, classic ways uh, for uh, PCI. You can use um, the extension manager or you can use the package packages and uh, import a package uh, to uh, import uh, the PCI. Um, I can I can publish or yes uh, I will give to uh, to the Tao team the all the link uh, to to download and to reach uh, this content. Um, in case of difficulties, don't hesitate to to send me a, a, a message. Of course, um, here uh, we have um, on the screen uh, we have the uh, default uh, GeoGebra interface. Uh, GeoGebra is thought uh, with um, the idea of perspective. Uh, a perspective means that uh, you, uh, a presentation will correspond to a need. Uh, for example, you, you could need uh, to, to have a 3D uh, uh, applet or uh, more um, uh, space to uh, just draw and, uh, 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 or for example, this uh, with a with a, a spreadsheet or, or this kind of, of perspective. You have all the perspective uh, available here. Here, classic graphic calculator, uh, geometry, 3D uh, graphing calculator, the calculator suite, equation editor, scientific editor, and notes. Notes, so it's a fantastic tool to, to draw and, and, and so it's kind of uh, free space in GeoGebra. Um, Here um, in this panel, you can also redefine uh, size and scale. 
to adapt uh, GeoGebra uh, to your content. Uh, you can uh, enable uh, the shift and the, the drag and the, yes, the zoom function. Sorry, um, you can uh, yes, a very uh, powerful uh, thing is you can also display uh, with a full screen uh, here, full screen function uh, the application. Uh, it can help uh, students that have difficulties to, to see uh, all the details. And uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, it, it works uh, with Zoom. I'm not sure, hope so. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, I developed the, also the, the translation and, and adapted it uh, to, to Tao. So you, you can choose uh, your language. And then uh, all the the menu will will be here. It's in French. You choose your menu, and you will have. Uh, uh, no, it's in English. Sorry, here it's in English. But uh, all all languages are uh, available. Um, so uh, these the, these are the main options. Um, important options also are uh, the fact that you can hide or show a menu uh, toolbar uh, and um, enable or disable the, the right click button. What is this, why it is so important? It is so important because you, have, you can consider um, GeoGebra in two, uh, in two ways. The first way is the classic application, even if it, is, uh, it could be uh, very specific. I didn't show you, for example, the 3D uh, calculator, or the 3D. Uh, Oh, yes, this. Look. You see, we, we are now in, in 3D uh, space. So, uh, okay, that, that's, um, but it's still the, the, the classic um, GeoGebra application. I mean by that, that you can use GeoGebra also uh, as a player. I mean, and you will see uh, what I mean by the player. Uh, but uh, the idea is you can create a complex item with animation, with special interface, and uh, freezing this interface uh, by adding all the tools that could modify uh, the project. So the student has to interact in a, a precise way uh, with uh, this, uh, your project in GeoGebra. He, he, lo he lose the, the freedom to create variable, to create uh, uh, points, elements uh, in your project, but uh, it will be very, very efficient for, uh, for your development. So how can you use, um, how can you use uh, GeoGebra? Uh, there is many ways. But uh, for example, you can use it as a complementary tool. So you can integrate uh, an empty GeoGebra uh, in, a, in, your, in your questions and um, the student will use it to answer the question. You can also use it as a part of the instruction. Uh, I mean that GeoGebra can present uh, some data uh, in a way uh, with a spreadsheet or a chart or many, many other way to present data. Uh, you can also uh, use it as an element of response. I mean that uh, you asked, uh, you, you, you built your, your question and it is uh, manipulating uh, GeoGebra. Uh, with mani the manipulation, the, the student will find a way to answer to, to the question. And uh, you can use it also uh, as an item framework. Item framework, I mean, it's a, a more complex uh, um, use of, of uh, GeoGebra, you can, for example, um, uh, ask the, the student to uh, proceed with uh, different steps and uh, follow some instruction, execute a process. Uh, you can have also in, in your uh, application, uh, there is many, many examples like this, um, sub-question, you know, you, you have steps and sub-question and you can collect, of course, everything. Everything. Um, the most important uh, with uh, with GeoGebra, oh, oh, um, uh, sorry, I'm lost. The 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 most important part is um, 
of course, the PCI is, 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 is very, very convenient. But why it is so powerful? It is so powerful because if you go to the GeoGebra website, um, you will have uh, access to uh, an enormous amount of resources. And uh, you go to the classroom resources and uh, you can find over 1 million free activities, simulation, exercise, lessons, et cetera, et cetera. All this content, you can uh, put it very quickly and in an easy way uh, in, the, um, in the PCI. How can you do that? I show you. Uh, for example, uh, just to understand the, the logic, let's go uh, here. And uh, I'm just picking one, uh, you see? It is loading the, the GeoGebra applet from uh, here. This, um, this exercise, uh, so uh, you, you, you can play with the addition and sub subtraction and, and uh, there's a balloon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this exercise has a code here. And you can use this code uh, in the PCI here. I paste the code. Uh, non, je l'ai pas copié. Uh, sorry. Hop. Copier. And you see, uh, you have a, a, a little uh, preview uh, to be sure that you are importing uh, the, the right code. And, uh, and you open the project. And now you have uh, the, the, the activity or the exercise. Uh, you have it uh, in, in uh, your tau. And you can save uh, uh, all the content of uh, the GeoGebra. Uh, and that's very important because you can have uh, on, on one page, one, one item, you can have uh, as many as you want, as many GeoGebra instances uh, as you want. That is the, the, the point with, um, uh, with the PCI. Um, Let's let's uh, show you uh, some example. It's slow because of the communication. Sorry, I'm going faster like this. But you see, uh, I, I have some examples here. I open the project. You see, it's really easy to uh, to to import and manipulate. Uh, the uh, these elements. Um, we can play a lot and discover uh, uh, many, many contents, but we don't have time because uh, we have uh, only uh, a few minutes and it's, uh, it's a million of con uh, one million of contents, so we, we will not. Um, What can I do uh, to, to be more precise on, on the... Yes, uh, a very important uh, thing also is um, when you are using GeoGebra, uh, you can create your own variables as an, an item creator, okay? So it means that um, you can use GeoGebra uh, to calculate, to create a score and uh, to categorize the, the performance of the, of the students. And uh, doing this, um, uh, I, I show you, uh, um, the, the idea is when you are importing a project, you see, uh, for example, this project, the project, sorry. Uh, you, you see that uh, all the menus are uh, have disappeared. Uh, so, um, when you are using the calculator uh, to create your own score, you just have to hide the possibility to modify uh, the, to, no, to, yes, you, you have to, to, to um, reduce the, the power of the student. He can, he could not, uh, he will not be able to uh, modify really uh, the, the GeoGebra instance, he will, only uh, be uh, able uh, to use it the way uh, you uh, prepare the activity.
Uh, GeoGebra is also um, could be also used uh, for many many uh, uh, activity, not only math. Uh, I show you some example uh, here for physics, for example, and uh, you, you see you, you can manipulate and adapt uh, easily uh, the the item uh, and modify also the scale if you need. Uh, to fit uh, to your uh, to your style, uh, and uh, so here an example for uh, uh, for physics, another one for uh, for chemistry, for example, and and lot, lot more, lot more. And you, there is also art, of course. Uh, here uh, you have the the the, the presentation. Yes, the atom, the, the la classification periodic, uh, uh, the elements. Okay, I, I don't know the, in, in English. I will not translate that, but uh, you see, it's quite rich, and uh, it's and and there you have a lot of lot of possibilities. Um, what else? Ah, yeah. Um, so. Um, I, I talk about zooming, internalization, uh, dimensioning, and uh, for um, each project, you can uh, use uh, also a very powerful uh, tool. Is it is the construction protocol, so you can have access at all the the, the steps uh, needed to build a project. And of course, if you want, you can uh, grab this information for the student and understand how he, he used um, the, 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 the applet and uh, what uh, were all the steps he followed to, to reach his, his result. Um, for the scoring, you can connect uh, GeoGebra to the scoring system here, response and uh, the match correct uh, using um, uh, some variables. Uh, it is in the in the documentation, but you can define some variables and uh, uh, Tao will recognize the variable and will be able to calculate the score and integrate uh, the score of the applet uh, with uh, the score of uh, the common interaction. And uh, I think that uh, I, I show you uh, <laughs> all the elements. So uh, if you have questions, Thank you, Jean-Philippe. Um, that was uh, a great presentation and we really appreciate that you're giving back to the community, something that you've developed. And we're sure that it can help a lot of organizations using Tau and using open source. Um, we do have several questions in the chat actually. Uh, so I know Patrick uh, uh, might be able to answer some of these as well. Um, so first question we have is how much time is required to develop a PCI from scratch? Oh, that's a very hard question because it depends of your ambition. It depends if, uh, for example, for, uh, for GeoGebra, the GeoGebra team was fantastic. So it took me, uh, it took me uh, uh, maybe uh, four, four months. But I have to adapt it uh, to the IMS format, and I I rebuilt a little. So uh, let's put a, a month more. But for it was very long for Snap for Snap uh, because I had no help, and uh, I tried to uh, to get some contact and uh, technical contact, and uh, I did not have any help. So uh, it was six months for uh, for Snap. But for other, it is quite it's really quick, you know, uh, for for some, uh, it, it could be uh, two, three weeks, or it, it really depends of the project. It really depends how, uh, if you have already, um, oh, I show I show you uh, uh, the the circuit. The circuit you need a month to do that. Okay, I did that in a month. So, uh, okay, uh, another question. Yes. Um. So. 
ECI allows a high degree of customization in questions while preserving interoperability. What challenges have you encountered in fully integrating PCIs into assessment platforms? Um, yes, that's very important. Um, there, there is some, the challenge, for example, uh, you see here, I have the project to create the Scratch PCI. Scratch PCI, Scratch program is very, very easy. So uh, the, the challenge is to make work uh, libraries outside of Tao, and uh, you don't, you really need to organize um, a kind of, um, yes, um, it's not only the Tao server you need, but you need a, uh, an, another server uh, to host uh, some files and some media if you want a full application. If you don't, uh, you have to reduce uh, the media because uh, the size is a challenge because of the also the, the speed, you know, how long the, does it take to, to, to load uh, the item for, for the student in the delivery, um, in the delivery, yes, in the delivery, sorry. And um, so that, that is the challenge. Uh, for example, I heard um, uh, the idea of uh, speech recognition. I did a work on speech recognition with a PCI. It's not here in, the, in this platform, but I did one. And uh, so, of course, you need an infrastructure uh, because you, uh, if you are using um, uh, the, the Tau platform uh, for a massive evaluation, uh, you need a lot of interaction with the server. So you need to have your own uh, uh, your, your own AI and uh, your own um, speech treatment on your server. So uh, for some, for very com quite complex uh, PCI, you just don't need the Tau uh, server, but you should, maybe you need uh, some, some server uh, near. Uh, it is, it, it's a more, the more complex uh, architecture. But uh, main, uh, uh, many um, PCIs does, doesn't need really uh, uh, this complex architecture. Uh, another challenge, excuse me, I, I want to be sure, but um, another challenge sometimes it's to manage a project, you know, for example, um, the for the chatbot, uh, to create a, a, an interactive chat, chatbot, um, uh, you, you need a, a complex interface and this complex interface uh, uh, can't, uh, it's not very uh, convenient to have it in town. So you need a, a special website that will produce a JSON file that uh, you can you will inject uh, in your in your PCI. Uh, uh, well, uh, sorry, Mark. I, I'm maybe I'm too long. But uh, uh, just another question: uh, How does the automatic scoring work uh, for the GeoGebra PCI? Um, the automatic scoring is very simple. Uh, you, 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 are, you are building your, uh, your GeoGebra uh, uh, activity. And um, for example, the, the answer is, uh, is in a field and uh, the student must uh, put, it, put the answer in this field and you will uh, address, uh, you will uh, name uh, this field uh, uh, with a, the variable, the correct variable. And the, the, this word correct, or uh, there is um, three codes. I, I don't remember exactly uh, what are the code, but the, if you fill it by the correct, it will search. This variable will communicate with the Tao system. Okay. And so uh, you, 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 will, uh, uh, you will have an automatic scoring that can be added to other uh, score in, in Tao. I don't know if I was very, if I was very clear. Uh, send me uh, an email. I can explain or show uh, in a quick video uh, how to use it. Uh, do you see GeoGebra useful for higher education or it is more, uh, it is uh, GeoGebra as a snap is used even by uh, uh, engineer and school engineer. So uh, it is a, a, a very, very powerful uh, these are powerful uh, applications. Could be simple, but uh, the potential is enormous. Voila, here is. My... Uh, do do you um, do you want more details or uh, you have more questions? 
There are a few more questions. Um, so we have, oh, sorry. oh no worries. Um, there's a question that says, can we use uh, any PCI in Tau? Sorry, that's my dog. Can you, can we use, yes. Uh, uh, my PCI, for my, uh, the, the PCI I developed are working in Tau, they are for Tau, yes. Yes, and uh, you can go to my GitHub, and uh, I will give you the, the GitHub. You can download or a package, uh, or you can um, maybe the extension, not for all, but the packages, you can you can use a zip package and put it in Tau. Um, in oh, okay. I was going to say, I think there's a question that um, that could go to Mark as well. In any case, Tau, a Tau user wants to create a PCI, uh, mm -hmm. do you help, or I mean, to either of you? Yes, yes, of course. I help, uh, yes, some developers, <laughs> some Japanese developer. We have a, you know, we have, a, yes, a friendship. What are the difference between Tao and other platforms that allow Tao to provide such flexibility? That's a fantastic architecture, uh, Mark. <laughs> That's a fantastic architecture. That's it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Very, very flexible indeed, um, very modular. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly the, where the question is heading. So the differences between Tau and other platforms that allow Tau, maybe you can reword the question a bit. But coming back to the previous one, yes, I can attest to uh, Jean-Philippe, he's done a lot of work, not just for the French ministry, but also other customers, other users of Tau, and can only recommend his services. Thank you. Thank you. I think this question might be asking, what are the differences between, like what makes Tau so much more flexible than other platforms? Well, it, it is the architecture of the system. Um, also, the fact that it's released as open source, so it, it gives everybody the, uh, the freedom to, to make modifications either on their own uh, or in, in cooperation with us. And uh, the advantage when you work with us at, at OAT is that uh, we can make these modifications available to the broader community. Um, so we have a lot of contributions that are funded from customers from all over. And every couple of months, the, the new features that get delivered, um, we make them available in, in the other products that we provide. So Tower Unite, which, which is a fully cloud-based version of Tau that, that we operate. Uh, and then of course, also to Tau Core. So all these features that get developed in, in, in cooperation with OAT make their way into the other products. So that that's, uh, I think some of the, the reasons um, people like working with us and and also an example why the product why we made it so uh so modular because it's really easy to to make these modifications and enhancements i think that's all uh that we have for questions right now, unless anyone has any final questions they want to drop into the chat. This last question was just answered with your, your last response. Um, if that's all we have for today, um, I will thank you, Jean-Philippe. Um, it was wonderful to hear mm -hmm. your presentation. And again, thank you so much for your contributions to the community. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the Tao team. Thank you, Agnato. All right. Great. Okay. So now we can uh, roll right into some closing remarks, Mark, if uh, that makes sense for you. Yeah, I, I don't know about you, Sam, but my head is spinning after <laughs> seeing all these presentations and really uh, outstanding speakers and and very interesting 
topics and important topics. Um, so thank you to all our presenters. And of course, also, I want to say thank you to all the uh, participants in the Tower Days, because we have people from all places, um, including the Far East and Japan, where it's already very late. Um, and then people from the United States and those regions where it's a little earlier in the day. So thank you very much. And yeah, I, I, I don't know about you, Sam, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think tomorrow is going to be another excellent session. We have some more Tao uh, hands-on focused sessions mm -hmm. where we'll be giving some tech tips for Tao power users. Um, if you scan this QR code right here too, you can actually download uh, a login for our trial environment so that you can play around and follow around while we go through some of those presentations. Um, you'll also hear from Quick Learning about uh, fostering learning equity in uh, underserved schools in South Africa and some more um, of the ways that we're also helping to support uh, support equity in places like Nepal, Morocco, um, and uh, Zanzibar. Right? But yes, yeah. and, yes, and uh, not to forget about uh, presentation from Uchida Yoko. Yes. So if you would like to to see uh, how Tao is being used in Japan, um, Uchida Yoko won an award from One EdTech uh, about highly innovative assessment solution. Uh, and it's actually way more than assessment. It also covers the, the learning side of the equation. So we'll hear about that tomorrow. Um, and then, of course, also from a couple of colleagues at OAT uh, <laughs> about uh, cybersecurity aspects. Um, and, and then, of course, also a, a how-to session. And to, to close the day tomorrow, the Tao user group, uh, which is the watering hole where all the Tao community comes together to exchange ideas and provide feedback and set the direction for the Tao roadmap. So yeah. I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, it is gonna be a, another great day. Um, so I think after all of these amazing sessions, we all have a lot to think about, a lot to kind of mull over. Um, so we wanna thank you again for taking part with us today and really hope to see you online tomorrow. Don't wanna miss it. Um, so of course, we'll be following up too with any of the questions that we weren't able to answer uh, in the chat in the time allotted as well. Uh, these sessions are all being recorded. So after uh, the event wraps up tomorrow, uh, we'll be able to share those in the future as well. All right. Well. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you all.